Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay for all the things they can podcast. Yeah. Welcome to the Oasis. Get ready for some re- ready player fun. Yeah. Ready player. Fine. Okay. It's ready player. Uh, okay. <laughs> ready player. <laughs> ready player. Okay, Steven. Okay. 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 We're, we're still doing the same bit. Yeah. Hello, everybody. We are hashtag the three keys. <laughs> so uh, I'm Copper. You're, yeah. you're Jade. Right. And he's Crystal. Ben's Crystal. Producer I'm Ben is Crystal. Crystal. Or ben Deucer is Crystal. I'm sick and I'm too tired and I honestly just don't he's have the energy the names, to do guys. the next name. He, he, he ran out of steam right before my very eyes. He's graduated to some titles. Yeah. I don't know. Hello, Fill fellow. in the blanks. Yeah. Um, if you're listening to this and you've listened to our last March Madness recap, you know that I was sick. I'm still sick. I'm a little bit on the upswing now. That's good. So we have three episodes that comprise my my head cold. It's that one. It's this one and one that will come out two and a half years from now. Correct. <laughs> That's it's, where the big, the complaints begin. It's literally a, a, an end of July episode where mm-hmm. I'm still suffering from the same cold, yes. right? This is yeah. a cold that spans dimensions. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Griffin Newman. My name is David Sims. This is a podcast about filmographies. Yes. The jump. Dun, dun, dun. A, a song, you want some synths, ben? A song that Steven Spielberg definitely love some synths. Okay. loves. You Van can tell Halen's every jump. time there's a, a needle drop in this movie that he's like, I cannot wait to play this song that means a lot to me. There's not any, there's so few needle jumps in this movie, though. There are enough. Mm, I thought it was going to be like wall to wall needle jumps. It Everybody wants to rule drops. the world. They play. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what's the one? Uh, um, we're not going to take it. Yeah. Uh, what I'm just a- saying, like, this movie didn't even have, like, crazy credits. Tom Sawyer. Yeah, but they didn't know that T- Tom Sawyer's not in the movie. I was really annoyed oh, about you're that. you're right. Yeah. Uh, it's in the trailer. Take on me. No, but that's not in the movie either. Is it not? No, it's just I already reference. don't remember. You exactly. Make my, you make my dreams? Was that? I think that was. That's it. over the closing credits. Jeez. <laughs> The podcast of filmographies. Directors have massive success check. early on in their career and give a series of checks to make whatever crazy past products they want. Sometimes they clear, sometimes they bounce, baby. Oh, cheer up, Griffin. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Jesus, he's dead. He died. Ben. It's just you and I, David. Give him an extra life. Hey, but guess oh, what? okay, here. Pling. Guess what? <laughs> I've left behind a series of clues yeah. so you can figure out how to take over this podcast. <laughs> Um, you think if someone listened to this podcast, how they'd be able to figure out what you like? I don't know. You Impossible. never really get to talk about your passions. I, I tweeted this, but uh, th- <laughs> this movie made me feel like uh, Seymour in Ghost World. Uh huh. When Enid goes like, there must be some woman out there who you can meet who shares your interest. And he goes, I don't want to meet someone who has my interest. I hate my interest. <laughs> like I watched this movie and I was like, I fucking hate my interest. <laughs> Burn it all down. Welcome to a collective crisis moment in every nerdy boy's, every nerdy millennial's life. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, where we realize, like, okay, maybe we shouldn't be this invested in all this crap. Yeah, maybe I should throw all my action figures in a fire. Uh, correct. Sometimes a director we've covered in the past through a miniseries has a new film and we have to go back and cover it. Right. It happened with Split by M. Night Shyamalan. We have to go back. We have to go back. Correct. It happened with The Post. It happened with The Post by Steven Spielberg, and now it has happened at long last with the director, Steven Spielberg. Yes. Who is back just three months after he released an Oscar-nominated drama. More prolific than everyone else we covered. With like a $200 million video game action movie. Yeah. Starring the Ty, hottest name. Ty Sheridan. Ty Sheridan. We do have to talk about Ty Sheridan's career, though, because it's fascinating. Yeah, sure. It's fascinating. I, I'm buttoning my shirt. Uh, Please keep it on. We're talking Ready Player One today. Yeah. So Ready we, Player One. Can we talk Ty Sheridan for a second? I want to lead with Ty Sheridan. We're going to talk about the film Ready Player One, a Steven Spielberg film. A His Ty Sheridan vehicle. film or something? I don't know. He's made a lot of films. I think it might be close to 30 now, right? Uh, a Ty Sheridan film. Steven Spielberg. Let's see. I 
I think, yeah, it might be 30, maybe 29. Yeah. Yeah, maybe 30. Good for him. It's a lot of movies. Is Indiana Jones, hey, what, Ben? What? Turning 30, it gets awkward. It gets awkward? It gets weird. What happens? Well, As your body starts falling apart. Yeah. Uh-huh. Of 32, excuse me. Uh, Humble brag. And you have to start sort of facing your own mortality. No, I'm 31. You're 31. Uh, yes, I, and then, what I'm else? I'm 29. Uh, oh, this is all great warnings for you yeah and then um, i'm right on the cusp i guess you start a uh, kind of feeling like you want to bring uh something else into the world like your biological sort of i don't even know what what, what would we call that like a bounce baby yeah, yeah. you want to bring in a you kind of want to bring in a baby <laughs> and baby. then just pass along all of the knowledge you have sure I'll say I, I know a lot about like Buckaroo Banzai and uh, Pac-Man. Yeah, it's like you kind of want to be Atari like, hey, look games. at all this these games and this nostalgia. You know, right. you get excited to this to want to. I like you know, yeah, me. exactly. And that must mean it's interesting, and, guess and that what? also means they're gonna a- love it. <coughs> oh, did you smoke forty cigarettes before coming in here? <laughs> Newsflash: I'm sick. <laughs> Jesus, that's what Christ. happens when you're sick. Griffin had like eight T's at the Alamo when we when we saw this movie. Yeah, it turns you, out Alamo doesn't have a great sick menu. There's no <laughs> chicken noodle soup at the Alamo. I'm sorry. You got kind of a noodle bowl, Ben, or something. What'd you get? You got an Isle of Dogs dish. <laughs> no, I didn't. Didn't you? I got Wasn't a salmon. Do- I got a, a it was like a roasted salmon salad. Oh, was it good? It was actually good. Yeah, it looked pretty good. Wait, don't. This isn't going to, I'm not going to be called like the fucking fish lover or something, right? <laughs> I mean, now you are. You're the one who said it. It feels a little repetitive. It does. I mean, we already yeah. have meat lover. You love meat. We, that yeah. Fish is sort of, you know, it's flesh. Yeah. It's meat adjacent. There was an Isle of Dogs special menu. I thought you had ordered from that where there was like a crazy complicated noodle dish that felt it like. It did look vaguely Asian. Your the thing dish. least conducive to eating during a movie. I know. Oh, trust me. I thought about slurping down a bowl of soup at a movie in the dark. Yeah, exactly. Who yeah. doesn't love doing I that? I love to look at my bowl as I watch a movie. That's why, yeah. I, yeah. I always order soup. I'll say, I, you know, more and more lately, I've been feeling like uh, I'm going to retire again. As we all know, I retired a couple of years ago, and then unfortunately I got cast on the tech, and that ruined everything. Sure. I'm going to retire again. Someday. Uh, just as soon as the, the tech finishes season 10. Right. Uh, I'm going to retire. Uh-huh. Uh, but I've just been, I've been feeling like, uh, I, uh, fuck all of my career ambitions. Okay. Goodbye to all of it. Right. When I was watching this movie, I went, everything I like is dumb. Throw it in the rear view. I just want to raise a child and have that child be better than I am. I want to raise a child that's in touch with nature. <laughs> you sound like you're going to give your kid a complex. You're going to be like, go outside and be with nature. And the kid's like, I, this Star Wars thing, you like, that kind of seems cool. And you're like, okay. no, no, okay, no. Here's the thing. Honestly, my goal is to give my kid... No complexes. Yeah, you're That's not going to succeed. Goal. If you go in with a plan, I think you might give your kid a complex. I'm not going to go in with any sort of plan, but uh-huh. I might move to the Andes. You're not moving to the Andes. I might move to the Andes. And if That's going to give your kid a complex. If the kid find oh, so every kid who lives in the Andes is fucked up? That's every offensive? Uh, I don't actor's know. Actor's son who's parent has decided to live in the Andes. He wouldn't even know I was an actor. Definitely has a complex. He wouldn't even know I was an actor because I'd be retired. Uh huh. Right. So you won't talk about your life. I'm just saying you're you're assuming that anyone who doesn't grow up in a big city is ruined. Oh no! Everyone who grows up in a big city is ruined. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm saying let's move to a mountaintop uh-huh. where Amazon, even Amazon, can't reach us. I don't think they have uh, cheddar bagel twists on the at the top of the Andes. Yeah. What are you gonna eat? <laughs> it's the only thing I would miss. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I would oh, die. Boy. Yeah. You, you would, would, you would die, die within minutes. You're like, hi. Where's pizza? They'd be like. What? They'd be like, no, man. Like, I thought you wanted to retreat from all public I life. I just want to raise a good, a good kid. All right. Well, let's Doesn't not Doesn't make... watching this movie make you hate everything you love, though? No. Really? No. no. We're on different sides of this. I, I do not feel the way you do about this movie. I, everyone's, everyone's too worked up about this movie. This movie's becoming like this sort of like, you know... Uh, yeah, no, this Peak makes me... nightmare moment or something. Like, this, yeah, relax. This movie makes me nostalgic for World of Warcraft. <laughs> Remember those fun summer oh, days? I love uh, G- G- Gul'dan. I don't know what happens in Warcraft. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. Orcs. Okay, so this movie's Orcs. based on a novel 
by Ernie Klein. Yeah, the guy who wrote Fanboys. Yes. Uh, what else is he? And then he wrote a book after this called Armada that was like a last Starfighter type thing. Yeah, that, that was post Ready Player One. Yeah, I never right. read that. I mean, I never read the book, this book yeah. either. It is, and a lot of people have been pointing this out. This is not an original thought. It is crazy to think about when Ready Player One came out in 2011 mm-hmm. versus like what, where pop culture is seven years later. Yes. You know, like when Ready Player One like the came out, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe thing, people were still like, <laughs> I don't know, a Thor movie? Like everyone relaxed. We all still you know? thought that like Avengers was untenable. Like, yeah, you can't put Avengers all those characters like, in one movie. In one whole movie, they're going to do a, a yeah. whole story for everyone? I right. don't think so. Yeah. But even then, people at the time were like, oh, okay. It and, was a moment where geek culture was now like commodified and mainstream. Right. And, you know, you had like your nerdist podcast and your... Uh, I don't know. South by Southwest had all its nerdy thing. I don't know. I mean, David Chen said if this movie had come out 10 or 20 years ago, it would have been a watershed moment. Yeah, but that I saw that tweet, but that doesn't I don't know what that means. Like, because how this movie wouldn't come out then. Well, it could have come out then because everything it's referencing is from before then. <laughs> True. And then but there wasn't a lot show. of nostalgia yet. You know, you got to build up the nostalgia, right? Isn't that like, you know. The, the people who are making the stuff now, they grew up in the 80s, right? That's the argument. I mean, not Steven Spielberg, to be clear. But we're but, so yeah. caught up on the I – mean, I mean, really, we're more in the 90s. The 90s wave song. is coming, right? Yeah, that, that, that's – I feel like that's going to be un- insufferable like but two I think, years But I think now. we're in the middle of that. Right, but it's going to get worse. Sure. I just think you, you go, I love the 80s was like 2003. Oh, <laughs> Was that was that peak eighties nostalgia? No, I'm saying that's when we really start chewing the eighties stuff. Sure, right? I don't say I'm not saying that show was responsible for that, but I'm saying that was the beginning of the wave. Yeah, you know, the tip of the spear. Sure, that was inevitable. Okay, I think we're pretty firmly in nineties stuff right now. I think we're already even tiptoeing into early two thousand stuff. Yeah, but you know, movies are slower than TV or slower than the internet. You know, this thing takes this stuff takes longer. The point is, Ernie Klein wrote a book in which the knowledge and love of all the pop culture that he grew up with is the most valuable currency in the world. He wrote right, yes, yes. That's the world this is set in. Right. Is the real world is ruined. Right. Just forget it. Right. Just bad. But everything's defined by his generation's pop culture. The man who made the virtual world everyone lives in loved the 80s. Much like the man who wrote the book. Sure. Right. Uh, And so, right. It's this, like, ossified hellscape uh, where everyone needs to know to say an 80s thing. And we're uh, fucking the the Noid or whatever. Rick, the wing commander. You know, right. Everyone needs to know the, the bed, cheat code for Contra. Code, right? Right. Exactly, yeah. But, but um, it, everything's stuck in sort of an infinite feedback loop, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we're just chewing over the same 80s stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, essentially, like... This movie has a lot of 90s stuff in it. Which mostly is legal workaround stuff. stuff. Yeah. 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 The, the book, which I have not read, I have, like, I have delved into it. Yeah. And it is... It's, and I hate to say this, much nerdier. Like, it's yeah. like a lot of, like, Zork and D&D and, like, you know, fucking, like, Black Tiger and Rush and, you know, stuff that's, like, more, like, really, like, stuff that, a lot of stuff that was left in the 80s. And also, in a movie, you can have a dense image in which a character zooms by the screen quickly and you don't have to call attention to it. Yeah. And then in this, you have to be like, Bats Maru walked by in a book. You have to say it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> David is enjoying Bats Maru. Oh, boy. And like, you know, yes, the, there are things that we'll talk about, such as like Ultraman is in the final fight of the book, and they couldn't right. get the rights to Ultraman because so the becomes- rights to Ultraman are kind of like a fascinating little yeah. like story on in themselves. So they were like, well, Warner Brothers has the Iron Giant, so yeah. let's do that. Yes. You know, stuff like that happens. And that's that's what happens when you make a movie. Especially a movie like this. But it's a movie in which society has fully crumbled uh-huh. because we have spent all our time just regurgitating the same pop culture okay. over and over again. Yes. Which the movie feels like it is. It is existing right on the sort of razor's edge of satire. And yes. it's like, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to pay attention to any of that. Right. Okay. 
Like, there's kind of a chilling Twilight Zone ask, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Movie right on the edges of what this story is acknowledging. And I think any way the movie acknowledges it is accidental, is a byproduct of them having to adapt the material. Because I think he pointedly avoids interrogating any of the ideas that are kind of accidentally baked into the cake. Maybe. I. Well, all right. Well, this is a larger question about criticism, but I see a movie and I take away what I want to take away from it. But I think I agree with you that, yes, I don't think Spielberg is that interested in like interrogating how creepy a world like this is. But the movie also does kind of end with this sort of like very lame conclusion of like, you know, it's good to go outside once in a while. That feels like that feels like Spielberg like insisting on that. That's not in the book. But also good to go outside once in a while is spoilers coded with now I'm super rich. I'm in an apartment that's surrounded by all the pop culture that we used to course, indulge in in yes, the Oasis. Yes. And I get to make out with my hot girlfriend. Yeah, good for him. Makes out Fuck with his everything. hot girlfriend. Fuck everything and the You're world. You're too mad about this movie. I'm sick. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have seen it. Well, you saw it. I know. And I wish I was in bed. <laughs> Ty Sheridan. Cheer up. Cheer up. Come on. I'm this sick. Is... What do you want me to do? Cheer up. This movie is a nightmare. No, it isn't. Riffin. It's a gentleman's six. Yeah, exactly. The battle toads are in this movie. The they are. are ben liked that. He shouted them out. He said, Battle toads. <laughs> I got excited when the fucking when Robocop showed up for a millisecond, and that was the only one of the pop culture things that gave me a a semi. <laughs> I didn't care about any of that shit, but I never care about that shit. I just don't care. Okay. Like, and I love the. Oh, and I'm the nihilist. I need to cheer up. No, it's just Mr. like I just don't care. Everyone is viewing this movie this as a yeah. as Where a find this guy a battleground, and you know for it, good reason. I think I think you have to view it that way. I'm because of where we are viewing every piece of pop culture as a like moral battleground, but I guess that's not a, a moral largest. battleground. But I think this movie, the way it reflects our times and like where where we are in the pop culture landscape and where we are this going, is, this is exactly what I'm saying. Like every movie has to be this now, or it's like right, like what does this say about the moment? And it's like, well, this movie they've been working on for years. Like you know, they, okay, but has, he, here's a movie about yeah, I know what it's about. Love of nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, I know. Being the greatest currency in the world, directed by the most powerful filmmaker alive, right. who's directing it as a sort of desperate plea for relevancy. You think he's making a desperate plea for relevancy? Yeah. Well, why do you think that? Because he hasn't had a home run blockbuster in a while. I don't think he cares. I think he cares. I think he wouldn't make this movie if he didn't care. Then why didn't he make like Robo Apocalypse? That's less of a slam dunk than this. And, and I'll say this to you. There. I think one of the reasons he makes this is because he didn't make Robopocalypse. Well, yeah. I think he wanted... I think I... We, whatever. We're, you're doing the thing that I don't like anyway, where I'm like, you know, it's like, he did this because... I feel like you're setting up untenable terms for us to discuss no, this I'm movie. Just, it's just like you're saying he you don't he like was it being desperate discussed. for a hit. I think yeah. he just wanted to make a big movie. Like, it'd been a while since he made, like, an action movie. His last action movie is... Tinted. Which didn't do well. But like his last real action movie is Crystal Skull, I guess. Which people hate. Yeah, it did really well though. Yeah, so I'm saying yeah. he has one movie that's good that did poorly. But don't you think he just likes to sort of switch it up? Like, like you know, I, I did a drama, now I'll do a fun movie, right? Like, I, I his agree. line of thinking is interesting because it, you know what I think? It's what? kind of almost like when the band breaks up, that yeah. big band, yes. and then they go back out and do a reunion tour. Yeah, yeah. And it's. Just playing the hits. This yeah, feels like fine. a reunion tour. Right. It's fine. Yeah. But it's also like you want to see them in their prime, their right. heyday. Right. Or you want right. to see them watch Jurassic Park age or into a new era as a band. Well, what she's done. He's, you know, you can go watch yeah. go watch fucking Munich or The Post or what. You know, you can go watch late Spielberg, like minor key Spielberg. But he wanted to Bridge. make a blockbuster, Bridge. though, right? Right. Well, so, he's making a blockbuster. Yeah, but he's just borrowing, like, kind of retired old yeah. no, but like, no, ideas no, no, and no, no, no. I disagree with you. It's different, though, because he made... The, no one's ever made a movie like this, period. This movie is crazy. It's Agreed. set inside a video game, yes. and it has graphics that are completely mind-blowing that everyone is just like, I don't know, it looks fine. Wait, hold on one second. Set inside a video game, graphics completely mind-blowing. Oh, I think Wreck-It Ralph is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> oh, can I talk to him? Yeah. Hey, uh, Ben, it's me. I'm, I'm going to wreck it. You're the best. That's not a bad Riley for a cold. Uh, come on. <laughs> well, wait now a second. Now it's getting Romano. <laughs> <laughs> come with me into the Ice Age. I mean, Romano 
probably would have been a fine Wreck It Ralph. Yeah, would have been a different sort of rage, like more of a like Seinfeldy rage. Yeah, like Riley is good at like primal rage. I understand that you hate when I tie movies into everything else in the world. <laughs> no, no, it's more like it's like the psychology of Spielberg. He's a I he's think, a tough guy to read. I think it is impossible to actually engage with this movie and not engage with those elements, especially if we're going to talk about it for an extended period of time oh and not God, a Griffin. fucking eight minute Lights Camera Jackson segment. Maybe okay, all right, relax. Beyond that, though, I'm not talking about. I'm just saying it's like I and I have to consume a lot of pop, a lot of writing in my job and a lot of culture. Writing. Humble brag. I know. Yes, it's a huge humble brag, and it's like I think that it's. Uh, I, I, I in my review tried to discuss like how weird this movie is. Yeah, but like I, I just hate or I just I don't prefer to assign like the evil of fanboy culture, which is evil and out there uh-huh like and saddle all of it onto the movie because that's just a lot for any movie to overcome and i don't think spielberg is someone who spends all day on twitter uh being a racist or whatever you know like you know does a lot of the things that these people do i agree with you 100 percent. Right. i don't think this movie is trying to feed the beast but i think there are right. two things going on right i think one there's a bit of sort of just complete ignorance as to the landscape right now i yeah he's I think he thinks video. I mean, he's he's older than video games, right? Like right. he's. It's just a different thing for him, right? I don't think this movie needs to address GamerGate at all. Oh no, no, Jesus! Ugh. But I think to make this movie and not understand Imagine how GamerGate Spielberg making a GamerGate. But my movie. point is, I think to make this movie and not understand how GamerGate has changed gamer culture sure. is a sort of willful ignorance. But that's that's another thing that's fat. That's sort of the point I was making earlier. It's like. This book, which, once again, sounds stupid. Yes. I haven't read it because it always sounded kind of dumb to me. Agreed. Came out before Gamergate. But and he, like, and but, yeah, now I know, and I know now, now, now they're making this movie, and like, it's afterwards. Movie now. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know. But like, it's funny to think about how much things have changed in online fan culture mm-hmm. in just a few short years. I agree. But they the- made this movie last year, right? Like, they like filmed it. Yeah. No, I think I made it in 2016, actually. Yeah, because I auditioned. Because he was in post production. I don't know if you know this. I auditioned for Wade Watts. I think I did know that. I, I think was. I remember that. Yeah. Very stressed out. I felt like I kind of blew my audition. We were doing blank check when you we were doing blank check, audition. and yeah, I came yeah, in yeah. really depressed because I was like, "This was my big Spielberg shot, and I blew it." Well, but you I know, also I don't know if this is the role that you want. Yeah. I have no. I have no regrets yeah, now. Yeah. Um. Although I, I think this movie would have been fun to make, but probably. Yeah. But. Uh, How much mocap was it? Do you think? Like, is he there when they're doing that shit? One hundred percent. Cool. He he kind of. This was another uh, at bat for him to do the ten ten thing, which I think he really liked doing. Right. Yeah. I think. He I had think that's so a big impetus doing for doing that. this movie. Yeah. Um. But uh, I auditioned for this. The the casting people on it. Um. Uh, Ellen Lewis was one of the best casting directors. Famous alive, casting director does all of Spielberg's movies. Does all of Scorsese's movies. She's like when you're watching the Post and you see fucking Zach Woods or whatever. That's Ellen Lewis. Yes. So she cast vinyl, right? And we were on vinyl. So she brought me in for that very kindly because I was kind of in in the the atmosphere at that moment in her in her atmosphere. Right. You got to get back in her atmosphere. Uh, I you know I uh, oh, scoop. And now you're leaning forward. When we were doing our Spielberg miniseries, uh-huh. I uh, I ran into her taking the bus, and we talked about Spielberg and Scorsese for like a while. Wow. And she say? was talking about she was trying to cast his uh, the, the, the Pope movie, the Pope movie, and the whole problem with that was that they never could cast it right. Like they couldn't right. find the kid. And she was like, "We're on like month five of not finding the kid," and that was supposed to be the next thing. I know, I know, and he he tossed that. It was know. sort of supposed to be Ready Player One and the Pope movie, right? right. And, it and said then the it was, Post took that. It was Ready Player One and the Post movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but she was saying, you know, it's the same thing with with Marty and Stephen. Her words, not mine. Sure. Where she said they develop a lot of things. Yeah. They find right. a lot of stuff a lot they're of interested boiling. in, yeah. and a lot of stuff comes close. And she was like, I cast ninety five percent of Silence in two thousand and four. Yeah. I remember that. I remember some of the stars that were in were, terms of were, all the Japanese actors. No, no, sure. She sure. said, "I went to Japan, but and they, I remember they had like the stars in place." There was a point where it was supposed to be, I think, Daniel Day Lewis, Philip yeah. Seymour Hoffman, and Gail Garcia Bernal. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah. And then it kept on shifting. Right. 
it kept on going with with three name guys. Benicio was one of the three guys was, at one point. I was about to say it was always like one of the guys was Hispanic, mm-hmm. and you were like, shouldn't they all home be, be or none? Like they're Portuguese. I don't know. But she cast all the Japanese actors in two thousand four, and then when mm-hmm. Scorsese was finally like, I got the money. We're making it in eight weeks. Right. All but Ken Watanabe could do it, and they recast him with Issey Ogata. Yeah. Huh. Um, but she was going through the same thing with with that. Uh, but anyway, side tangent. She brought Good me tangent, in though. for Ready Player One. Yeah, Ellen Lewis is great. Bomb she, ass, she's bomb a real man. She, she's phenomenal. Um, she uh, brought me in for Ready Player One, which was an act of kindness on her part. But I auditioned for Ready Player One with my vinyl look. Right. So you didn't look like uh, a fresh face. I looked like a child molester. Boy. I looked like a child molester. <laughs> I was going to be kinder. No, don't be kind. You look like a porn tech. I looked like a porn tech. Like the guy holding the boom mic. Yes, I did. And then later, maybe you have some blow and you try right. and like, you know, talk someone into like, you know, hanging out or whatever. And it was like the dead of summer. It was like 120 degrees. And I showed up and I was dripping in sweat, which is like a bad look. I had like gained weight. I had a mustache and sideburns and an unruly mop of hair. Like we used to talk about Star Wars together in a closet. And, and I looked you, like that. You look like a pedophile. It was insane. Yeah. I mean, my joke was that I looked like the only person who was simultaneously a pedophile and a victim of pedophilia. Because <laughs> you're, so, you're, you're, you're a smaller guy. Right. I look like an Oros Boros of, of sexual assault. Oh, a human centipede. If I looked like a human centipede. It was a bad <laughs> period for me visually. You're going to cut everything we've said so far out, <laughs> right, Ben? Especially all the coughs start over the podcast. The best, the best part is that when we sat down, Ben was like, remember, like, we're just going to kind of post this one raw. Yeah, it's going up quickly. We're doing a, yeah. We were like, so like, a child molester or Oh, I've bonus? noted all of this. It's, none of this is going to make it into the, yeah. the episode. Fantastic. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Hey, David. Yeah. You know, these days you can get practically everything on demand. Like our podcast. <laughs> You can listen to whatever you want. It's convenient for you. So let me ask you this. Why are you still taking trips to the post office to mail letters and packages when you can get posters on demand with stamps.com? Are you trying to be nostalgic? Yeah. I mean, I think... Is it retro? You think it's a cool retro thing? Only 90s kids will understand? I think that uh, stamps.com, which is a service we use and we will use for merch soon, coming soon. Yes, coming And we're, we're of course, just talking right off the hip right now. Uh, is it's just something that's very convenient yeah. and uh, it, like helps you buy and print official U.S. postage for right any letter or package that you use right yeah. from your computer. Twenty four seven. It wants convenient for you. And you know, mail carrier comes, picks it up. You you click, you print, you mail, and you're done. Could you be buy easier. and print official U.S. postage for any letter, cool. any package using your own computer and printer, any mug. A uh, onesie, a uh, mouse pad. Oh, Do people still buy mouse pads. We should sell mouse pads. Maybe I don't know. Isn't it weird how like it used to be like I'm setting up and I need like a computer, and a I need pad. a desk, and I need a, oh I better have a mouse pad. Yeah, that's Spielberg's next movie. Look, you just click print mail and you're done. <laughs> it couldn't be easier. Yeah. Uh, so um, you guys can use stamps.com right now. You can use the promo code check for this special offer. Oh, God, you- I have to write a check. They only accept no, checks. That's no, a bummer. wait a second. What? You go to stamps.com before you do anything else. You click on the radio microphone at the top of the homepage and you type in check. Oh. And then you can get $55 of free postage, a digital scale, and a four week trial. And, and the digital scale is going to be so useful again for this upcoming merch because. It will enable me yes. and us yes. when sending out merch. To Let's just... be honest, mostly you. Yes, of yeah. course. Uh, I'm going to be filming. <laughs> you think I'm mailing out merch? I think Briff's going to mail out all the merch. All right, I'm doing all the work. <laughs> yeah. But it will make it really easy because I'll be able to weigh all of the items and then just have the uh, postage printed right there right. and just send it out. It's, I genuinely have, in my entire life, found sending packages very daunting because yeah. of the weight thing. Yeah. Right. And we, we have a scale now, and uh, it's been great. And I'll say this, you know, I love finding alternate uses for our sponsors' products. Uh You get this scale at home. Let's say you want to see how much one specific part of your body weighs. Uh Oh, how heavy is my finger? This is a great scale for that. Great. Very helpful. Uh, So, yeah, once again, uh, go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and then type in check. Yep. And then you'll get $55 of free postage, digital scale, and four-week trial. And that's how sick I am. No time for bits, Dr. Jones. So, Ready Player One. Yeah. I read this script 
in oh, you, 2016. Did you read the whole script? I did. I was surprised they sent it to me. I'm, su- I'm surprised, too. That's amazing. Now, I feel like the draft I read was the one right before Spielberg came on. It was like the pure Zach Penn draft. Uh, wait, but was it, Klein wasn't involved uh, early? I think Klein wrote the first script. Mm. Yeah, because the credited writers are Klein and Penn. I, I am Maybe told they wrote and it I together. am sure that other people did passes on yeah. the script and it's very different from the book, like right. very, very different from the book. The general plot structure is the same, but the book is like completely now different. I'm curious to see if I can find the email. I Ooh, think, find I think the email. it was a Klein Penn draft. That makes sense. I think they work together. Zach Penn, who we were talking about off mic, mm-hmm. who's a real like boring hired Hollywood gun. Hey, come on. He's my uncle. Oh, is he? No. Um, who... I typed in ready and I got that my Best Buy order is ready for Pekka. What was it for? Last Jedi Steelbook. Don't at me, bro. You got a Steelbook? I got a Steelbook. I'm crazy about Steelbooks now. Oh my God. This is a real heel turn. I, a steel I've already turn. said this. I've been buying Steelbook, <laughs> Steelbooks like a I fiend. just want to make clear that uh, when I said steel turn, which I thought was really funny, I hit Ben. With my hand. Cancel our show. Flinched. Cancel our podcast. <laughs> Griffin, he wrote... Occupy blank track. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a real 2001 flashback. I know, or right? 2011. Only 2000s kids will understand. Uh, 2010 kids will understand. Mm-hmm. Boy, I feel bad for the 2000 teen kids. Yeah. They're going to have trouble being like, man, wasn't it great in the 2000 teens when... Um, let me check this. Donald Trump was president. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> When all of our seminal <laughs> pop culture was reboots of other generations' pop culture. Hey, man. Uh, the very problem. But that's what the Star Wars is in the 70s. It's reboots of 30s pop culture. Hey, but. Rampage is an original idea, though. <laughs> and I'm very Rampages. excited about it. Because Big has never met Bigger before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that with Zach Penn and Ernest Klein, Big met Bigger? Yes, 100%. Yes. Um, I don't have the email anymore. I just want to say, someone pointed out. It's too bad that you don't have the email. Right. Like, the big difference between Force Awakens and Last Jedi, sure, right, is that, like, Star Wars was Lucas putting together a pastiche of all these different things he of grew course. up with. yes. And yes. blending into something new. Because whatever adage you want to use, there are only six stories, this and that. 100%. No, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Force Awakens, a movie I like. Enjoyable. Still a defend. Right. Is a movie about Star Wars. Absolutely. Whereas Last Jedi is, like, its own thing. Oh, yeah. But we're still playing in the same sandboxes as opposed to, like, mixing and matching elements. I, I agree. I mean, I'm not saying, like, Hollywood's got some, you know, looking in the mirror to do about some of the shit that's coming down the and pipe. And not just Hollywood. I, th- I think all of media. No, I think that it's just Hollywood and everyone else is blameless. No, yeah. No, uh, by right. the way, what's number one in the TV ratings? Oh, Roseanne. <laughs> uh, the biggest premiere of the last 10 years. Pretty much. We have to go back. Yeah, we sure. Um, um, what I was gonna say. You read the script. I read the script. It was pretty shortly after he had been announced as the director. I think Zach Penn and Ernie Klein wrote the yeah. the script together. But the notion was always: there's how are they gonna fucking make that movie? They won't be able to clear the rights. It's impossible. It's unadaptable. Right. And then when Spielberg signed on, they went, "Oh fuck! It's Roger Rabbit." He's going to be able to call in the favors and get all the different properties in here. Right. And he's going to be able to get the carte blanche or the black check, if you will, mm-hmm. to make this film the, the way he wants. Right. Um, I remember reading this script, it feeling like, despite the structural changes to the material, a pretty straight adaptation of the messaging of the book. Right. It kind of went in one ear and out the other. I went, okay, cool. I got it. I feel like I kind of sped read through it. Yeah. And because I even went, Spielberg's going to take a, a strong, strong like fork and knife to this thing. Yeah, he he's going to chew it up and spit it back out and turn it into something different. Uh-huh. And I'm surprised by how much this film is kind of in line with that. Maybe it's just the previs. Like maybe it's just like at a certain point you need to lock the script. I don't think it's that. I okay. I think it it truly is. I think there were two things he was interested in doing here. One is, I, I think he's been moving towards more adult fare. Sure. Right? So he wants to... His blockbuster movies haven't worked as well. He hasn't had one that's an unqualified Jurassic Park type for the fans and the critics movie in a long time. Yeah. I don't right? even know what you call... I mean, War of the Worlds, I guess. I don't but know. even those were like divisive films. That was sure. He was making his big Spielberg blockbusters, but they were dark and haunted and post-9-11, Shadow right. of the Towers kind of stuff. Right? Right. Um... 
I, I think he wanted to just do a crowd pleaser. I don't think it was yes. out of like That's fear what you're of saying like, have I lost by. my ma- it's magic. It's a movie. Right. He was like, it's not a film, it's a movie. That was his like selling point. But I think he picked this property that to him felt like path of least resistance. It's fun. Just like a this fun, is just grab fun bag. There's yeah. nothing to deal with. Yeah. I also think he really liked the Willy Wonka elements of it. Yes, yes. Which he yes. seems to really engage with in this movie. Yes. And he put a lot of time and energy trying to get Gene Wilder to play Halliday. Then Gene Wilder died. Gene Wilder died after saying, I don't want to do this. Fair enough. But uh, he it died was right on the cusp. August 2016. Right. Yeah. right. Um, I think Gene Wilder in this movie would have been really depressing. A, because clearly he was in a very feeble state at that point. Well, yeah, he had like Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Yeah. It's sort of hard to imagine. And and B, I just think seeing Gene Wilder talk about space invaders. That's not what he did, though. He didn't do that. Right? What? The Gene Wilder. He didn't do that, thank God. He didn't do the movie. Yeah, it'd be horrible. Right. But we had, he. the good thing happened. Right, the best performance in the history of cinema, Mark exactly. Rylance. Yeah. It was it. The best thing happened. But the point was he wanted to put that fine of a point on it and be like, I'm literally making the Willy Wonka movie. I'm going to have the old Willy Wonka in the computer. I I, I get what you're saying. My only question is like, how is that possible if Gene Wilder has had Alzheimer's disease? I just, I can't figure it out. I think Spielberg went to him and said like, I think I can do this with you. I think I can work around you. And Gene Wilder was like, I really don't think I'm well enough to do this. All right. Yeah. At the time, I was very disappointed because Gene Wilder is one of my favorite actors. And I wanted him you to love give Gene one Wilder. last performance. Didn't know he was terminal at that point. Right. His last film was Another You. Yes. Which I've is never seen it. Bad. It's with, it's with Pryor, right? Yeah. It's the worst of the Pryor. And Wilders. Pryor's like all fucked up. Bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Funny about Love. Do you like that? No. No. That's the Leonard Nimoy one. Yeah. It's bad. Do you like See No Evil, Hear No Evil? Yeah. What? Really? I love that movie. That's like one of my favorite cable I think, TV movies. I think movies that movie is kid. an entertaining yeah. cable TV movie. I have a feeling yeah. it would feel a little gamey watching it now. So I'm trying to find mm-hmm. your last I favorite. So is it like stir crazy? Like, how far do I have to go back to find a Wilder performance? See, you I've love? never been a huge fan of the prior Wilders. Uh, do you like Haunted Honeymoon, which he directed? I've never seen that one. What about uh, The Woman in Red, which he also Yeah, directed? I mean, I like Woman in Red. I like uh, uh, World's Greatest Lover, Sherlock's. Younger brother, you know? That's sad. I'm trying to find if there's like an 80s no, I mean, Wilder. I guess there I, isn't. I don't think there's an 80s Wilder Panky, I love. Panky, Gilda Radner. Yeah, I think those movies are fine. Yeah. I think those movies are fun. I like him so much that I enjoy watching any of them. Right. I think the prior Wilders don't age very well. Uh, yeah, no, I they don't. I think they're really they good don't. together. I don't think those movies are tremendously good on their own. Stir Crazy. Stir Crazy is pretty good. It's like, fine. Yeah, yeah, it's like pretty watchable. And I think everyone forgets that Silver Streak, they're only in it together for like 15 minutes. Uh, I've never seen Silver Pryor's Street, yeah. very much a small supporting role in that film. Right, right, right. And once they saw how good they were together, they added a couple more scenes. <laughs> it's interesting to look at Wilder's filmography. It's so short. Like it fits onto my whole screen, like yeah. the whole filmography. And it's weird to think that like by the time he makes Young Frankenstein, he's already sort of like there's nothing – better following it you know what i mean but then what's weird is that like he, he where's he think of that as like oh he's he's only gonna get crazier you know but he's one of those guys where his films that he directed were pretty successful they were like doubles or triples and the prior mm. movies were huge well of course no i know they did well i'm more saying like it's like in terms of the canon i'm re- yeah and i'm also just realizing like i for some reason i thought like Young Frankenstein was before Willy Wonka. You know what I mean? Like, no. I had this image of Pryor as and like, he does the Mel Brooks movies and then he's a superstar and then he does the Pryor movie. You yeah. know, like. No, like, and, yeah. and Blazing Saddles and. Um, Those are before too. Yeah. Well, or Blazing Saddles and Young year, Frankenstein are the same right, year, which is, which is crazy. crazy. Yeah, that's insane. That just, that's just insane. Which is insane. Uh, my Mount Rushmore, though, is like Wilder, Keaton, Keaton. Both Diane and Michael? <laughs> Michael and Buster. <laughs> Fair. Man, throw Diane in there. <laughs> you can have three Keith games. Diane <laughs> and and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Those are right. like my those guys. Those are Griffin's guys. Those it's are my not guys. like he says those are the four greatest actors in the world. They're just Griffin's four favorite actors. And I also think that literally everything I've ever done is me trying to combine those four people. I um, just rewatched Spider-Man 
uh, Homecoming, which is fine. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And Keaton's so good in it. He's so good. He's amazing in it. But I, but I think I steal most of my moves from those four guys. Yeah. Okay. But Wilder, right? We had a, we had fun there for a minute there talking about Gene Wilder, but yeah, he isn't in this movie. movie. He's not in this movie. No. He's pointedly not in this movie. Cast Mark Rylance, who's his new favorite actor. And Mark Rylance gives the most interesting performance in this movie, and the one element of this movie that I think is kind of subversive. Yeah, this I mean, it's it's a great. Performance. He's the one guy kind of really wrestling with shit in terms of what this movie's saying. As I, soon as he shows up in those baggy jeans, straight leg yeah. jeans, and just his body language, it like transported me back to being a kid and seeing like weird adults right. at a video game store, yes. just like. What's wrong with right. that? Well, guy? and that's the guys other guys at the comic so, book store. Right. Yeah. The weird thing with this movie is because it takes place in the future. Yes. You have Mark Rylance playing an old man who grew up on stuff that you knew. You know, Mark Rylance didn't grow up. Right. On. Mark so Rylance's character right. was obsessed with stuff that was at that point like thirty years old or whatever. Like that's, exactly. Right. Yeah. That's how far in the future we are. Right. Right. Maybe even maybe twenty years. Like, yes. Yeah, whatever. Right. Um. They, I actually read that there was actually a script that had references to more recent pop culture, like uh-huh. AKA future pop culture. Yeah. Like they were, there were going to be references to move like movies from like the 2030s and shit. Yeah. And they decided to take it out because it just didn't make sense. And there was no way to do it without having to explain it too much. Like they, they tried and they failed, which is weird to think about. I'm going to jump way ahead because I don't know if we're even going to like do the plot on this episode. You don't want to talk about Gunters? Yeah, I want to talk about the Gunters. Gunters. Egg Hunters. Gunters. They're called Gunters. (laughs) It's a weird name. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Gunter, for a second here, I thought I was at a Central Perk. Drink your tea. Gunther. Or is that your raspberry coffee? No, it's a hibiscus tea. I got it from Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts, famed for its hibiscus tea. Look, desperate times call for desperate measures. Uh, What what did you want to jump ahead to? What was the thing you wanted? I, I think there is – talk about the elements of this movie where – I'm not saying like the movie is problematic because it doesn't address this. Sure. But I think the, the movie – The movie is a little problematic. I agree. Yeah. And I also Let's, think this movie is kind of sort of like pointedly playing with bumpers on. Like it's right. using the defense that, of like, it's fun. Don't th- that's, think about the rest that's of it. That's what's problem – right. Those are – every problem this movie runs into, it's because it's just sort of like – uh, well, there's nothing to see there, right? Like, ah, uh, who it's cares? It's like dancing in front of a fire. It's, and, and it's just sort of like, I mean, the way I put it is like, it's like Spielberg's like, the future is hell, but like, we could still like have a good time, right? right. We, could, like, we have literally an stop building new stuff right. because we keep on like we're so obsessed at the with old. And this is why yeah. I was so fascinated by this movie, the whole production phase, because I was like, right. there's no way he doesn't grapple with that, right? Doesn't really grapple with it. And to be clear, we held out hope that maybe he was going to make a super subversive, like, Verhoeven film. Right. But even there's, like, a midpoint between the two that's, like, a movie where he still gets his happy ending, he still makes it a surface pleasure, but he at least sort of, like, pays service to all the larger ideas that are circulating in the atmosphere right around the story. Right. But I think the problem is they're not circulating in Ernie Klein's atmosphere. No. And that's the problem. It's like, if he had, and I, by the way, I, this is Wikipedia, so take it with a grain sure. of salt. The way they put it is, uh, Klein wrote a film, wrote, uh-huh. wrote the script. Then someone called Eric Eason, who I've never heard of, okay, uh, rewrote that script. He's like, he like wrote a better life. I yeah. think he's just one of those Hollywood rewrite guys. Uh-huh. And then Zach Penn rewrote the script. So is that were, when Spielberg came on? Yes, like because Ernie Klein. So I feel like it was the first Zach Penn draft that I read. Ernie Klein wrote this script before the novel even was published. Like you know, like because this this no, oh, this book was like optioned right. like before they were just like slam dunk. Yeah, totally. Here you go. Okay, so I think I read the Zach Penn draft that got Spielberg to sign on. That makes sense. That's what it feels because like. I remember Zach Penn being credited on it. Yeah, and it felt very much like this. It had the same amount of narration in the opening and all that sort of shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I was gonna say is. There is something to this movie yeah. that this is me extrapolating from it, but I think a more probing filmmaker or filmmaker who wasn't just concerned with fun because Spielberg's clearly capable of tackling these things. And you go, this wasn't an Ernie Klein's ecosystem. Well, that's what's interesting about adaptation. You get someone to take someone else's work exactly. and look at it with new eyes right. and come at it from new angles. That's what I like about adaptations of course if they go right yeah so something like the godfather which is like totally a mediocre book yeah that copa was able to go like book right oh there are bones here where i can throw some other flesh onto it 
Right. But like Coppola has always been very upfront about like that book's kind of gross. Right. Like, yeah. You know, I don't but know. I think yeah. Ready Player One's kind of gross. Yeah. Not I mean, I haven't, read it. But I haven't read it, but it seems sure. Seems lame. Sure. Um, and th- there was hope that Spielberg as a very intelligent man. Sure. Would would want to sort of bring some more stuff into the picture. Like Gunters, though. Gunters. So, what I was going to say is... You read the script. We're still on this. No, 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 oh, okay, no, no, okay, no, okay. no. This is me jumping to the end, a thing oh, that kind okay, of yes. What you okay? wanted to write, yeah. This movie is getting at something, which to your point, you're a critic, you look at the final product, you take away with right, what right, you want right. from it. Yes. But I Death don't, of the author. I don't think this movie um, has anything to say about this. The notion that, you know, uh, there is a certain type of dude who succeeds and rises to the top and becomes a gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. And that person gets to sort of, those people in their positions sure. get to choose the canon. Right. They get to define the canon and go, right. we all love Back to the Future. Right. And that suddenly has more cultural weight than everything else. Sure. Because the executives at the top of the heap right now are the people who grew up with Back to the Future. Right. Right? Yeah. And a lot of those people who rise to those positions come from similar backgrounds and have similar taste. Yeah. And this movie is a story about, like, one of those examples to the extreme. A guy who creates a game-changing technology Mm -hmm. that is totally a monument to his favorite pop culture. And everyone else in the world has to bend to his tastes. Sure. And and show reverence to his favorite pop culture. Because he's the one who wrote the book, right? Right. There's a thing I want to see in this movie. Which is a greater sense of democracy, especially in like the end battle, where like yeah, everyone's just whoever they want to be, and they're all right. You go like the Lena Waithe character, yeah. right? H, right, and she's like this sort of tech wizard who can build or fix anything, right? Right, right? and she builds the Iron Giant is like her big final play, yeah. Which it's like, aside from the fact that it doesn't really fit with the time period, sure, what have you, but right? it's also really cool because it's big. It's big, and he's a nice he's a nice giant. Yeah, and we'll never talk about him again on this podcast. Never. How dare you? How dare you? Um, never. Not in our worst episode ever. Not no. For, no. Definitely. Never. Never. Yeah. Um. You, I want some character in this movie to go. Yeah, you know, I don't really like this stuff, but it's like you got to play the game. Mm. Because everyone's like, oh, man. But, no, I of course. Fucking and the I, Goonies are the best. Sure. The whole movie. And you want someone to be like, I don't know, I feel like this stuff's kind of overrated, but I'm just trying to win this game. And there's a part of me that wants, like, some characters, especially at the end after he gives his big speech and is like, everyone, let's storm the kingdom. Yeah, right. Where he's sort of like, be whoever you want to be. Right. And you have people who are like, I love fucking noir movies. Sure. You know? Well, I'll be fucking Joe Friday from Dragnet. Right. <laughs> That's who I would be. Yeah, in you the know, Oasis. Like you just want to see this, like yeah, I get what you're saying. Pop culture, which there, I mean, there, I guess there is. I mean, again, I don't, I didn't even really look at the like the mob, but there, you know, you catch glances of uh, battle toads and Overwatch characters, or whatever, right? Like, I, it's all probably if you freeze frame it, like yeah, I mean, bunch we have of shit in eras, there. And you have yeah. Overwatch characters, yeah. and you have different things, but it's all the same sort of gatekeepers' tastes. And I mean, in you're a movie that's about, about letting the monoculture, the, yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But the monoculture is largely defined by. I know, I know. Yeah. So in a movie that's literally about that kind of gatekeeper creating his own world where he defines the monoculture, don't you want to, at the end where the idea is that this thing becomes a little more democratic and it's given back to the people, go like, you know what? Actually, I love romantic comedies. I'm going to be Tom Hanks in Sleepless in Seattle and I'm going to storm the castle. Right. But all right, I mean, here's they, my, they, I, I didn't see. To this. Um, I didn't see uh, Jared Leto's Joker. I know in it, and this movie does not get twisted enough. Actually, sadly, true. I'm gonna the, eat the, my what you're tre- basically saying is this movie needs to be more twisted. I'm going to eat my cheddar bagel twist while you throw out your counter. No, my counter is basically like this is not a movie about uh, like a happy future. No, and it uh, uh, the idea of a future where everything is based on like pop culture references and every video game is just like a countless echoes of other video games and all that shit is like so plausible. Yeah. And it, like, it's if, like a harrowing dystopian. Exactly. Future. And if that did happen 60 years on, yeah, people probably would just be like, well, what I love is, uh, 
battle toads like scrolling 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 you know and so uh i think i can't even imagine this this movie ending in a way that's not a bunch of but don't you, you know, at least want to see that references. movie be a little tongue in cheek at the end with like yeah. i don't know if this is a good thing or at the end try to break down that wall a little bit i'm not saying the entire dna of the film has to be rewired but the last 10 minutes isn't that what you ultimately want to get to is like maybe we should stop reliving this antisocial nerds favorite pop culture from half a century ago yeah, it's just a different movie. I guess this dude like, who never formed a life for himself, just well, lived in his head with all the shit he that, does. No, no, that is what Spielberg's getting to. Yeah. But what he's not getting to is the pop culture part. What he's getting to at the end and what this quest is designed around, right? Because mm-hmm. the idea of the game is that Mark Rylance's character, uh, I have to look up his name. Halliday. Halliday, who designed the Oasis, which is a virtual world that everyone plays every game in. He died and he, his will essentially is like you have to solve this quest and find the keys and whoever finds the keys gets the game. Like he'll bequeath his, you his the game. His will Wonka, if you will. His will Wonka. It's, it's, it literally is just the Willy Wonka thing except Willy Wonka is dead and is now just like a cyber avatar. In the game. In the pre-recorded game. Pre-recorded messages. Right. And the, the, the purpose of the quest, right, mm-hmm. is to understand that his life was perhaps a little too devoted to all this and right you know uh it got a little meaningless for him and he misses his friends and so how do you how do you win the game you have to be super devoted to, to his brain <laughs> you yeah. prove that you're the best person in the world by knowing all the I same know. stuff that's that he knows, the which inherent he defined- flaw of the client story it's right. very strange <laughs> although i think it's fascinating like to do a memory play essentially i just don't think it's like uh, endorsable. You know, I like, agree, you know. but then you go, shouldn't this movie at the end come to a point where instead of it landing on a sort of glib like, oh, the friends we make along the way are what matter. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's just take breaks on Tuesdays, guys. Don't you want it to come to a point where you're like, maybe we should stop praying at the altar of all this stuff? But that- that's, that's, I mean, nothing in this movie is going to do that. You're just talking about another movie. I'm talking about a, a better version of this movie. I'm I, not talking about a complete alternate reality this, version of I know. Of the film. This is a fight we have a lot, though, and it's a fight that I always reference the Scott Ackerman joke, like, I, I love West Side Story. I just wish that they didn't do any singing and dancing. Like, yeah. you know, the old joke where it's like, when we were talking about this with Isle of Dogs, where we didn't get in a fight on Twitter about it. No. We, like, went back and forth, and at no point were ever disagreeing with each other. And I told you he did turn. He did, which was very mean of you, and I was upset. Look, I mean, we, we have to address <laughs> some things have changed in the last couple of months of making this podcast, and David we're now enemies. has an unsatiable hunger for turds. Um, where it's like you were saying, like, I mean, uh, like, the movie should just not be it's set It's a turd in world Japan. problem. And- <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, I think the movie should just not be set in Japan. Right, and I agree with you, but also I'm just like, but then that's just a whole other movie. And like, I don't understand at what point Wes Anderson decides this movie, his dog garbage movie needs to be set in Japan. Because in the interviews that I've been trying to parse, right, he always just sort of says like, and then we decided like, well, what if we merge it with this homage to Japan that we've been thinking about? And I'm like, why did you decide that? Like, and he never really provides an explanation. But that also speaks to... But that was the genesis of that movie. But it's also the difference between you and I and how we come at stuff in right. relation to our own careers, which is like, your job is to look at the final product. And right, I'm like, here it is, you've given me this, and I will now think about it. Yes. Right, and I'm always trying to figure out how to make things better. Because I'm someone who's like, why isn't this working? Mm. You know? But I mean... Either because it's my own thing or I'm on set saying shitty stuff and I'm trying to figure out how to make it better. I think... Not on set of the tick. The scripts are good. Uh, but Every other thing I've ever been in. <laughs> well, let's imagine you yeah. had been Ty Sheridan, mm-hmm. whose career we are now... Talking about. Going to discuss. He was discovered Here local... Go. Talent He's a Texas scouts. boy. He's a Texas boy, local talent scout. He was born and this... Frightens me to say. In the year 2002? In 1996. Oh, that's much better than I thought it was going to be. He's 21 years old. Yeah, I thought, And he's like been in movies for a while. I thought he was born after 9-11. I thought you were going to no, scare me he, with that. Because he's, he's you know, that he then he'd be like 70. I wasn't like doing that. the math in my head. Right, right. right. Uh, he was, you're, you're right, he was discovered in Texas, and he was in the Tree of Life as the not interesting character. He's the brother who dies. Uh-huh. He's not, uh, is it Hunter McCracken? McCracken? Yeah, yes. he's good in that. Very good. And, and what, didn't whatever. really act again. No, so just, neither of them were actors, yeah. right? They were discovered by local town scouts. Uh, Terrence Malick pointedly just wanted like real Texan boys. Right. Um, 
like the legend goes that when they cast him, neither he nor his parents had heard of Brad Pitt. Yeah. He was that far outside of yeah, yeah. the sphere of pop yeah, culture. Sure. Right. But he sort of acquits himself as this good naturalist sure, young but, actor. Like, it's not like you watch the tree of life and think like, no. Oh, that kid's going to pop. You think Hunter McCracken might pop, but then right? he becomes the first actor to have movies play at the Cannes Film Festival three consecutive years in a row. Because he was in Mud, which he's very good in, I think. And then he was in Joe. Joe, the David Gordon Green movie with, with Nick Cage, right? Right. He's now, above the title on that one. Right? Yeah. Now, Mud's the one I think he's really good. He's quite good in that. And, and Joe, I, I don't know. Right. And you get the sense that, like, I, I believe Nichols is friendly with Terrence Malick. And David Gordon Green is as well. All three of the people you just mentioned are friends with each other. Right. Yes. They're all like, you know, poets of the high prairie. So yes. you imagine that Terrence Malick said, look, this kid doesn't have a lot to do in the movie, but I'm telling you this kid's a pro. If you want to cast a naturalistic yeah. Southern boy, yeah. this is a good right. kid exactly. to cast. Yeah. Right. But then he goes from that to like, Zo- Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse, playing Cyclops and the X-Men, and then being the lead of a Spielberg movie. It's kind of a fascinating career because his whole thing was just that he was sort of like natural. a natural kid. You know, he was also in Last Days in the Desert, and I'm told he's quite good in that. Like he he made some uh, you know, some more sort of indie movies. And he's as well. in uh, he's the, in the Stanford Prison Experiment. The other one he's good in is the one uh, the Neil Hamburger movie. Oh, uh, Entertainment. He's very good in that. I've never seen that. I think he's a good actor. It's odd okay. that he became... I want to say something a little mean about him. I don't think he's very good in this. Oh, I don't think he's good in this at all, but yeah. I also think it's a terrible character. So, like, I, I agree. I don't, you know, yeah. Like, seriously, like, had you gotten this role? Like, I don't know how you have fun with this role. I don't either. It's such a boring-ass character. I don't either. And if I had fun with it, it would result in a movie that everyone hated. Right, or you being immediately fired. The ways I would keep <laughs> myself entertained would be really, really upsetting to the general public. But, um... I think he's got like a funny face. He's got a funny face. It's it's weird because he was kind of a handsome kid and he's in a weird, I don't know if it's just a weird transition phase where his like features are settling oddly, but in this movie, he's got a funny face. Yeah. And I just don't want to be mean about it. Because I even think he was handsome in X-Men. Yeah. Like I and like here he is as a kid, you know? Yeah. And he's like a a cute cute kid. kid. Yeah. But, and now it's like, yeah, he's got this sort of like. Andy Roddick kind of wide face. I don't know yeah. how else to describe it. He's just sort of funny looking. But he's good at Whatever. reacting. I'll stop being He's mean. good at being sort of steady. What do you think, Ben? About his face? Yeah. Yeah, he looks like he's got a big head. <laughs> Fair enough. He did a lot of movies where it's him reacting to older actors, yeah. right? And he's good at that. It's sort of just holding his own. I thought he was a pretty good Cyclops, although that movie didn't give him anything to do. I can't. I literally don't even remember anything he does in it. He must I, I think he fits the Scott Summers mold, but that film doesn't have that character do anything. I've always said there's one guy who should have played Scott Summers, and now he's too old. Who is it again? Timothy Oliphant. That's who I want. Oh, it's weird that that's your one guy. That's my guy. I've always thought, like, that is the guy. Like, say you made, like, an X-Men series that began in, like, 2000 and was mm-hmm. still going on to this day. Hypothetically. He would be okay. good as a young Cyclops, and he'd be good as now, like, a veteran Cyclops. He's so perfect for it. Interesting. Like, because you need someone who is angry, but like is good at sort of like you know tamping down the the anger. Because Cyclops yeah. is such a weird, boilingly angry character, and uh, you know usually the movies have just interpreted him as like like he's the annoying straight guy See, who like says what the rules are. Now that you're saying anger, you know who I think could do it well. Who? Army Hammer. Yeah, probably. He's so handsome, but yeah, yeah. But you cover up those eyes. Sure. Well, sure. And I feel like Army Hammer is really yes, good at... he could at, be good at the boiling anger. Yes. He's good at hating the fact that he's boring. Uh, for sure. No, he's good I, at playing characters who are like, I resent the fact that you think I'm basic. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 He'd be a good... Yeah. He'd be a good Cyclops. He'd be a good Cyclops. He could be a good angel, too. He could play like half the X-Men. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, especially the early He'd X-Men. He'd great Havoc. Oh. My favorite X-Man. Maybe we should get Fincher to do a Winklevoss style Army Hammer plays the entire plays X-Men. All the Summerses, or at least? Yeah, sure. Fine. Uh, sounds good. Um, Army Hammer plays Cable, Cyclops, and... I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Wade Watts, Ty Sheridan's character, Parzival. Right. right. Who's named... I don't mean to say his name all sneery, but... But then they call him Z, because there's a Z in the middle of his here. name. This character, who I'm sure is even more insufferable in the book, yeah, 
is the worst. He's, he's just the worst. like there's zero reason to root for him. He's a know it all, and that's all he's got going for him is that he is a know it all about a particular guy's life. And he's kind of that's his skill. Boring. He doesn't really he's have a fire in his boring. belly. No, I understand why he's boring. He grew up like in a shipping container in Columbus, Ohio, and he spends his whole life in a video game. But like, also, like, so same with everyone, right? And they're more interesting. Which is what's annoying about this film is the only reason he's the protagonist is because he knows more about this stuff that Ernie Klein has decided is the greatest power in the world. And yes, but also just because like he's the got pop the- culture he's inspired by. Is about all these bland people on Heroes Journey surrounded by a more colorful ensemble. Yeah. That's what every piece of pop culture that he's doing, like that he's, Ernie Klein is ripping off, is inspired by. And that's what this character is. He's just like the 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 hero. Quote but by unquote. the very design of this movie, they could have completely redefined who the protagonist of the yes. film was. Because once he gets into the Oasis... He presents himself as a very boring, generic. I was about to say hero's journey character. He picks his art, uh, his avatar, right. as like I don't know, an anime boy with like fucking Billy Idol hair. Like that's it, right? Like, so don't you want them to try to find the weirdest oh, kid yes. they could possibly yes. find to play the role? Yeah, but they they don't they don't do enough digging into that. And again, I think the book does more digging into that. In but the it's book, they're far more different from their avatars. Yes. And this, yes. you're like, he could have played Parzival yeah. with makeup. Yeah. You know? Agreed. I and, think and Olivia Cook, who I think is a great actor and I think is so solid in this movie. I think she's excellent in this I, movie. I do too, actually. Yeah. She's and, a great actor. She is like a really she's exciting the real talent. Deal. Yeah. yeah, she's, she's one of those Everything I've seen her in, she's been the best thing in it. But you also get kind of bummed out that it's her. What do you mean? Well, because it's like the whole device of like, I think in the book... She is physically like I think she's very overweight, or she's. Mm, I don't think so. Maybe she might be handicapped differently. Uh, excuse me, did you see her in this movie? She's hideous. Well, that's the point. She's, she's got a birthmark. Fucking disgusting. She's got a birthmark. She's Ben. Would you agree? When I it's saw, it's like because she's like you yeah. wouldn't want to look at me, and I was like, oh, she's probably like uh, self conscious about her. I mean, hair. I can't believe this movie skirted by the ratings with a PG thirteen. You see her. That's an I, I mean, I, I threw up on immediately. Well, that was just the thing. thing. I was Barf. eating my salad, and I. Th- threw up all over the place <laughs> yeah she's got like a birthmark on her face she looks like incredible like i, I don't know like right. she's gorgeous she's got like a red spot on her eye like right. i don't know and like the whole thing of like and she's you, very like gerard butler in the phantom of the opera where she's like don't look at me you like, wouldn't like <laughs> me if you met me in the real world yeah, it's like right. what you're not an olivia cook type <laughs> um yeah but no i but even even with all that said and it's mockable the blur, yeah. birthmark thing Movie's better if she's the protagonist. Movie's better if um, uh, Letitia Wright is the uh, yeah protagonist. She was cut out. Uh, movie's better if Lena Waithe is the protagonist. Movie's you, better if like you see Letitia fucking, Wright in the background of know, a shot for I one know. moment. I want I want her to be in the movie. But I think when Olivia Cook shows up and she's like, "I'm fucking Trinity. I'm a radical. Here I am, like right, right. bunkered she's the out." Trinity, you're like, yes. "Why aren't you the hero of this movie? Like, and like you're interesting." And and we're not even as saying, an actor and as a character. We're not even saying that to be contrary it's like it the movie is crying out for one of them the to movie be the makes hero. no especially argument her or lena waif like for wade they? being the guy at the center of Except the story he's nerdy about the um fucking holiday i keep forgetting his name uh holiday's right life history which we talk about the way culture shifted right you imagine that this movie exists as some sort of like masturbatory fantasy of like all the shit that I love that has no value in the real world, I'm going to write a book where that makes me the most valuable person alive. Uh, yeah, sure, yes, yes. But for that movie to come out now, you're just like, okay, fucking get over you it. Relax. Coming from two guys who became best friends by going to movie trivia and dunking on nerds Beetle all the juice. time. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like, I just, I, you, you just feel like you want the movie to cede control. You want the movie to, at a certain point when he meets up with Olivia Cook, IRL, go, oh, you know what? This isn't about me. You really need to win this. I'm going to help you win. I, it's just what I'm just some fuck boy who knows shit, you know? That's what he is, though. Like, she's a more interesting actor and a more interesting character as written. Parzival lives in the stacks. It's a, it's a fucking trailer <laughs> on top of a trailer yeah, on top it's of a in trailer. Columbus, Ohio. And, uh,. The world is shit. Right. The world uh, looks like Carl's just... Jr. sandwich. <laughs> I keep on making Carl's Jr. references. Fine, dunk on him. We're trying to get our, our sponsorship. Yeah, we want to get We're trying to neg Carl's Jr. into sponsoring <laughs> us. Um, 
he he's Parzival. His best buddy is H, who we don't know is is Lena Waithe. Who's uh, fun? Who's fun in this movie? Very fun. She's my favorite character. Yeah, definitely. I like her avatar too. Like, uh, I like the um the midsection. Yeah, it looks cool, like, and uh, I like that he stretches out yeah, that, that he can stretches. sort of inspector gadget his like, way out of danger. If I'm yeah. eight years old, I want that action figure. Like, that's cool. I like the stretchy. Yeah, merchandise spotlight. There must be some toys. Yeah. But but it's also like so, Spielbergers. Spielbergers. Uh so like Funko made the toys. Yeah. And they have like a set of the three keys. Sure. And then they have a box set of action figures. Okay. Sort of in the mold of the old Star Wars figures. Sure. That's just the four. It's it's H, it's Parzival, it's Artemis. Is that her name? Uh Artemis, yes, with an E. And, I mean, with a three. Right. And then IROC. <laughs> uh, IROC is the TJ Miller character. Right, yeah. which we'll get to that. Mm. But but the other thing I is... I kind of like the design of IROC, though. I do, too. Yeah. The other thing is they made a bunch of Funko Pops for this movie, which is kind of ingenious because then it's like the entire Funko Pop line is essentially a Ready Player One line. Sure. Right. Like, you put any fucking character next to Parzival, and it's like, all right, it's that scene. Hey, you know who else is a great character? Uh, Blue Apron? David, yeah, tell me more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is beyond sweaty. You're into this is, you know who's a good character? <laughs> he said, you know who's a good character? Then he said, David. <laughs> <laughs> so I answered that Blue Apron is a good character. He flicked his sweat onto you. I'm sorry about that. Look, well, Blue Apron's a great company. And exactly. do I wish they would make a character? Yes, they should have a mascot. A box? Is there like a person who wears a blue apron in uh, like a, a pop piece of pop culture? Um, mm, Swedish chef usually wears a white he apron. Has like, I think he has a stripey apron, doesn't well, he? Well, it goes through different permutations. Oh, sh- all right. He's okay. done striped. He's done solid white. Well, do you think that Swedish chef would like the kind of meals that you can cook with blue apron? Yeah, I think blue apron should hire Swedish chef as... Their spokesperson. Sure, that sounds like a not expensive proposition at all. No, and he's also, he's so good at just speaking, communicating basic messages. <laughs> messages like, you know, Blue Apron is a leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. And while many people know what we do, many just don't know about the types of meals you eat when you cook with Blue Apron. Like, yeah, quick bucatini with broccoli and pecorino cheese. Yeah, short rib burgers with a hoppy cheddar sauce and a pretzel bun. Italian style shrimp and sweet pepper. I actually made that one last week. It was really good. Yeah, you know. Uh, I make like two or three of these a week. And like, could, I have like gone full in on Blue Apron. You could do it all in under 45 minutes without a trip to the grocery store. What I like about it, and I, I'm I, this is off. I'm not really like, mm. it's like, I, I'm a good cook, but like I always cannot be bothered with like, using the remnants of my cooking to like make a sauce or stuff you know you know like that like sort of final sure uh act of making f- yeah. a meal and blue apron like the way where they're always just like all right now you've got you got a pan full of meat juice like pour a little of this in there make a roux start oh, sure. around hey buddy sure hey buddy you got a stew going <laughs> so and, rest uh, of uh, yeah we got it only 2000s kids will understand i i'll say also I just like, that. like i'm about to start filming yep and last season I ate horribly because get home, it's late. Let me just grab a fucking burrito or whatever, you know? But it's like the idea of having this stuff delivered to me on a weekly basis. Yeah. And I can just like pick the nights I feel like I have enough energy to make it. And when I got my first shipment, I was like, I'm a very picky eater, right? Yeah. yeah. And I got it and I was like, oh, this sucks. They sent me a dish with broccoli in it. And I was like, wait, no, but I'm making it. Right. Hold uh, the broccoli. Well, fair enough. You or, know? Or you could eat the broccoli. It's good for you. I'm not going to do that. All right, fair Please, enough. it's off brand. He's a picky eater. Well, all right. So the point anyway. is, you have a certain like, you know, you get to remix the culture a little bit with Blue Apron, and you get to be your own Parzival. That's all true. You get to pick two, three, or four out of the like twelve recipes every week yeah. that they they have an offer. Yeah, they send like non GMO ingredients on. You know, the meat has no added hormones. The meat's always really good. It's actually something that's impressed me about it the most. Okay, so and this is coming I... from a meat lover. I mean, what do you think of the meat? Uh, it's really great. Yeah, well, it is actually, yeah, really good it's really high quality. All um, right. But so, uh, I'm I'll interested. how do I, I'll let how do know. I be this character? All right. <laughs> Blue Jeez. Apron is treating blank check listeners $30 off their first order. If you visit blueapron.com slash check. So you check out this week's menu. You get $30 off of blueapron.com slash check. It's Blue Apron. It's a better way to cook. Cool. No time for bits. Dr. Jones. 
So back to Ready Player One. Yep. Uh, so Wade uh, work, lives in the Oasis. Uh, Earth is hell. Uh, he goes uh, on a race. There are three keys that you need to find. Each key comes with a clue for the next key right. to ultimately lead you to the Easter egg, which is a literal egg that will grant you ownership of the Oasis. Which is worth half a trillion dollars. Right. Uh, it seems to be everything. That's a funny everything. bit when he goes half a billion, know, half, half a million. A million. I um, wish I could do his story voice. trillion. He's so funny. He's so in funny this in this movie. Yeah. That scene near the end where he's like fumbling for the key. Yes. And his avatar's like, y- you want it, right? Like, is, he, everything he delivers, every line, even if the line isn't, like, that great on the page, it's just, like, hysterical. There's also the image of him with the white wig that Lawson, our, our buddy Dickie Lawson, has been posting forever. Yep. And it's so much funnier in the context of the movie where you realize he's delivering that from inside a coffin. <laughs> It's so weird. He's lying dead with coins on his eyes. He sits up and goes, oh, I am dead right now. And he's the coffin is, I believe, a Star Trek torpedo canister. Correct. He likes Star Trek. He likes everything. Look, I'm just saying there's a world where this movie is fascinating. Because these agree. are the people who make the things we're obsessed with. I think if everything was as sort of... Um, I think Rylance, his performance is actually digging in. Yeah, I think I, so. Too. I think it's like, here's a guy who literally only understands pop culture. He and is the least well-rounded human being in the world. Exactly. And and his big realization as he was dying was that. Right. And, like, that's the lesson and he's I, trying I to impart. I think he plays that with the appropriate vacancy. Right. The appropriate inability to uh, interact and connect, right, and with the lingering sadness and loneliness. But also, and speaking to the Willy, I Wonka wish the rest thing, of the movie was as smart as his performance. Speaking of the Willy Wonka thing that you're talking about, yeah. though, like that's what Willy Wonka is about too. Where it's yes. like he's like, it's a world of imagination. I live here. I have no friends. Right. I only have Oompa Loompas. Yes. Isn't it great? And <laughs> Charlie's the one who's like. This is scary. Yeah. This is very weird. <laughs> right. And the other kids are like, I want to be rich, you know, like, and so the other kids in this movie, in Ready Player One, mm-hmm. are IOI, or the evil corporation. Right. Sorrento? Sorrentino? What's his uh, name? His name is Nolan Sorrento, played by Ben Mendelsohn. The great Ben Mendelsohn. He who's is. fun in this movie. I think he's fun. I think he's fun in this movie. I think he's fun because he's playing him as like a coward. It, it is always surprising when I see a non-sweaty Ben Mendelsohn performance because he really started he landing hard here as his like sweaty wormy guys. And he's good at like as a guy who's like vein is pulsing right, right here. Yeah, he's really good at that. Right. And the cigarette is like his mouth is so sweaty. The cigarette won't stay between his lips. Yeah. Like he's got sweaty teeth. He, and we were talking about his lisp. It's like a very, very, very slight sort of speech thing. Like, but I, I like that he just is. owns it. Oh, totally. Even when he's playing really together high status people like yes, this. Like this. Th- that having been said, this guy's kind of like just a uh, a weak willed. Uh, not weak willed. Call him a hater. Spineless, and a fanboy can always t- spot a hair. <laughs> uh, he uh, wants to turn the Oasis into like a cell phone game. I guess like there'll be like ads. He wants to make it a freemium thing, right? And he heaven for fend. He uh, interned- probably is good because then everyone would stop using the fucking Oasis. Yeah. Yeah, and try to, I don't know, plant a tree or something. Exactly. Go save the dead earth. Move to the Andes and raise my son. But at the same time, even though I just made that joke, that's what I like about this, where Wade literally has some line where he's like, we're just trying to enjoy ourselves before we die. That's all the Oasis is for us. Like, we know we're doomed. Like, he basically admits it. Like, this is just the only fun we can have. Okay, he admits that directly in dialogue. Right. And the performance never reflects no, that. No, the performance doesn't really reflect Because there's it. so much fucking explaining in this movie, yeah. too. I understand there's a lot of table setting. But sure, like Spielberg's sure. someone who's pretty good at elegantly offering exposition. Or even Sometimes. figuring out how to set things up visually. Yes. Sometimes doing the Mr. DNA info dump where it's like, you know what? I just need to do three minutes where a cartoon explains the whole thing to you. Yeah. This movie, they never stop explaining what's going on. And there's the moment where they set up the sort of fake. They make Sorrento think that he's back in the real world, but he's still in the Oasis. And then it cuts to them at the computer screen. And Wade literally explains, oh, so that's cool. Sorrento is – and you're just like, 
We get, you just have to show us the two screens, I which know. are literally I labeled know, Oasis I know, in the real world. I know. I felt the exact same and way. And that's it's like one bizarre. moment that I harped in on, but there are like 50 But that's of the those. worst one, though, where it's That's like, the worst one. I know, where we get it, and then he's like, wow, so we hacked into the mainframe, and he's... He's not in. He's in the oasis right now. Like, and here's the thing: that's the used. That used to be the thing where Spielberg would gracefully, subtly pan his digital camera across to those two computer screens. You would see the two images, and it would actually get a laugh out of the audience. Yeah, you'd go, "That's clever," and that's pretty graceful. And by just explaining it, you're just like, "Oh my god!" Can I order another cup of tea, please? You know, yeah. I'm flagging down my fucking Alamo. Waiter for for a cookie platter, which those cookies were very good, weren't they, man? They were awesome. They look good. You guys got some cookies. I got some cookies. Yeah, they look pretty nice. I had a burger. To paraphrase Corky Romano, we guys wanted some cookies. <laughs> uh, so they go on the race. That's the first big set piece. Which no one's been able to beat. And he keeps on going back to the archives where you get to watch every single moment of Halliday's life. Right. When he was building the Oasis with Simon Pegg. Yep. Who at first you're like, this is a weird small role for him to take. Right. A and wig, the whole time a wiggy I was role. like, when's Pegg showing up? I also recognize his voice as the curator. Yeah. Uh, Pegg is playing the curator who is the sort of Dr. No of uh, this movie. Uh, there's nothing he doesn't. Oh, oh, K N O W. Yeah. I thought you meant Doctor No. No, I'm talking about Doctor No. There's, There's nothing, nothing he doesn't. He doesn't uh, who's giving a lot of flat facts and so on. I did love the look of the curator. I did too. I actually I like all the curated parts. I like that. Yeah. That to me is video gamey in a way that's fun. Like I, yeah. If this movie wants to be video gamey, then great. You give me a race. I think the race scene is basically fun. Like it's a you know yeah. I mean, big cool set piece. Action. Action's set pieces in this film are well executed. I think the, the race is maybe the best one. Except the lesson is so corny. That's, What's the lesson? It's like, you gotta go, go back. Oh, well, that, that's... Like, don't that, participate. I mean, like, again, like, I, and uh, I hate nitpicking because, like, I understand that the, the plot has to work the way it works, like, very basically. But, like, someone would have fucking gone backwards. We've all played, like, Donkey Kong. You go backwards. See what's yeah. that way. Um, but uh, forgetting that. Ma- Ma- I like Monty the- Lazic, uh, right. friend of the show, past and future guest. Yeah, who's not allowed to talk about Spielberg on this podcast, but carry on. Was talking about being dragged to, to see the movie. Yeah. And she was like, I'm, I'm being dragged in backwards. And I was like, haha, backwards? That's a plot point. And she was like, are you fucking She's kidding like, shut me? up. Backwards is a plot point? Yes, it is. Gotta go backwards. You gotta go backwards. No, but I also, I was just gonna say, I, there are, there's that kind of video game where it's like, you have to figure out some weird logic puzzle yeah. through conversation. I like that. That's fun. I like that yeah. it's in there. Like the curator. I think he's a chill bro and we could hang out. Yeah. Griffin's rolling his eyes and I think he could stand to be a little more enthusiastic about the curator. Excuse me for being sick. <laughs> it's not funny. The race is kind of cool. He gets the coffer key. Yeah. He also gets, it's a great Angels in America reference. He gets it at the Bethesda fountain. Oh, right. Great Angels in America reference. Only 80s kids will understand. Angels in America is actually the 90s. But you just go like, say for like the occasional thing like King Kong, you're like, none of these things are that meaningful to Spiely. Is it meaningful to anyone? Like who fucking, yeah. I mean I'm, like. I'm she, saying like. if She Ed- has the Akira bike. If Edgar cool. Wright made this movie, yeah. it would at least be the pop culture that he grew up with. Right. But like Edgar Wright made this movie and it's Baby Driver or whatever, right? It's like Edgar Wright's good at making these kinds of movies. Like he made Hot Fuzz, right? Right. It's just like a slightly less irritating version of that idea where it's like, well, I'm going to reference lots of things that I love and yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I think his version might have been a little more interesting. I think this is someone who didn't like Baby Driver. Baby Driver's good. I can't believe that's the one you'd like. That's the way out of what? What's the, you know, that's the one out of your mezzo mezzo on a lot of the rights. Yeah. My right ranking is, uh, Scott Pilgrim. Number one, for sure. Like that's, that's his masterpiece. Uh, world's end. Number two, baby driver. I think world's end is his masterpiece. That's a great movie. Yeah. Baby driver. Three, uh, Sean Four, hot Plus five insanity. People get really mad about that. Cause Sean of the dead's great. And baby driver is Sean of the dead is a movie that I cannot deal with the turn it takes. I just don't think Which it lands turn? it the, to, to, to true horror. Oh, I love that. Right. And I, I, I want to love it. Like intellectually, I, wa- I like that it's doing that. But every time I watch it, I'm like, I'm, I'm still, I'm not prepared for it. It's too, it's too nasty to like suddenly. But that's the thing for me is 
when it makes that turn because it's been a comedy up until that point, I get more scared watching Shaun the Dead than me I too. do most horror films, yeah, which it, I think it, like, is impressive. It unsettles me. I agree with everything you're saying, but I've, I've after, I just finally was like, you know what? I think I just don't like that. Anyway, 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 the point is every time one of these things gets dropped in, anytime there is a needle drop, which we said there aren't too many, no. I'm just like Spielberg's like, this is what they want to hear, right? This is the stuff that they like. Which just makes me a little depressed. But it doesn't have as much as I thought it was going to have. I thought it was going to be like a just an orgy of it. Just like it would be the Toontown sequence of Roger Rabbit. Exactly. Or like an episode of Family Guy. It was just going to be like, ha, ha, ha. And instead it's mostly Parzival, the great Parzival. The great Parzival. Navigating the oasis in cool ways he he goes on a race he figures out the race that's cool he goes back he meets artemis he saves artemis once so she takes notice of him she sees him going backwards she's the second to get the key he tells h h tells their other two friends saito and show daito and show daito and show who are like a samurai and a ninja they're japanese yeah it's and they're very, very well very developed characters through. yeah exactly uh, one of them is 11 uh-huh. and the other one is also japanese He's handsome. He's very handsome. Uh, uh, Win Murasaki. Yeah. yeah. And he's, the other uh, one is 11. Yeah, he's 11. He makes a big fuss about that. Win Murasaki, who plays the um, the older one. Dido. He's like a big like J-pop star. Oh, he's really? Like, he's like a hot shit in Japan. He's a handsome guy. I like the design of very Dido. Handsome. Yeah. But, but now it's sort of all of them working together. It's a big point that they don't clan. Yeah. Because one of the rules of this thing is if you die, you respawn, but you lose everything you've ever collected. Exactly. So it's like you can live in the game forever, but if you die, all your coins spill out of you. and All your weapons. Your weapons all your, your what have you. Yeah, exactly. And um, they don't want to clan because I guess they're all selfish. I don't. They never. Really no, it's just I think they just don't want to like conform. I assume the clans, yeah. which we don't see, are just like boring clubs. I don't know, right? Right, because yeah, I mean, like Sorrento's got like an entire. It's like the. Um, well, this is my favorite part of the movie. Faruka Salt, like the dad hiring the people just unwrap yeah, exactly. candy bars all it's day. Every exactly day. right, and it, but it's like it's all it's very Dickensian. He has like these people in like debt servitude. Right. Who like he buys up their debt He's in a the debt game, collector. Yeah. and then they have to like work it off by like doing virtual work, which is so weird. Where yeah. he's like, plant that virtual bomb there, you know, like you know, go out, build me some roads. It's such a like, oh, it's so crazy. Yeah, I, agree. I wish the movie had more about it. Yeah, I agree. <gasps> Why are you so mean to whom? Me, my best friends. Shut <laughs> up. Fuck you. <laughs> Should I eat some turds? Yeah, eat a couple turns. Uh-huh. Eat two turns. <sighs> eat the turns. I, I can go get some more chocolate kisses if that's what you're thinking. No! You gotta eat a turn. I don't... Okay, fine. I eat the turd. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Was that so difficult? Was that so hard? Uh, so the second quest is the Shining quest. Right. It's kind of fun. Well executed. Yeah, really well executed. I feel like this whole movie is well executed garbage. I mean, he does a really sure. good job of approximating... In what is a digital set, he even replicates the 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 textural look of the lighting and the cinematography of The Shining very, very well. Much so, yeah, it's fun. <coughs> Again, yes, I agree with you. It's a little garbage. But they start to realize the key to this whole thing is that it's like righting the wrongs of his. Halliday it's all went about- on a date and he didn't have the courage to make a move, and then right. Simon Pegg married her instead. And the Shining thing is actually just them living through the date, and everyone else right. would get caught up. In the Easter eggs and the Shining references, and really it was just about having the courage to ask her to dance. Yeah, yes. I just wish the Spielberg showing up to direct this movie was the 2000 sci-fi trilogy Spielberg, the Mm, Minority Report, AI, who is like... (sighs) You know, I think it's just, it's the, you know, for one, he wrote AI, right? Right. And Minority Report, that's a Scott Frank script. He had Cruise, okay. which gave him a lot of leeway. Yeah, I'll take a fucking Scott, Scr- Scott Frank, Tom Cruise combo over Zach Penn and Ty and Sheridan. Time, but you just wish, like, have Joe Cornish do a pass. Have, yeah. like, whoever do a pass, yeah. you know? I mean, I think this is the inherent flaw of adapting the book. Like, it's like, you can't, he either you, you just fuck up the book so entirely that it's a different thing, and then maybe Ernest Klein is freaking out. I have no idea, like, who was dug in where, but... He should have just done something different, maybe. But, like, if Len Wiseman wanted to make this film, they would have said, like, hey, you can't piss off Ernie. You got to stick to the book. If Spielberg's doing it, it's like, do whatever the fuck you want. And, I mean, or to find be, another to film be fair, to make he, or whatever. It is very different. Joey was saying, like, 
his crowd was like, they didn't do this part. Right. And apparently IROC is not, is in like half a sentence in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. IROC in this is like the bounty hunter character. Sure. Who is like a fucking angry gamer nerd. Like he's he the kind yes. of guy who would throw the N-word at you yes, constantly. That is the character he's playing. And it's, they make him really just kind of like inoffensive and funny. He's just comic relief. He's right. rumbling. He's TJ Miller. So but like, even for the moment he talks, he's kind of like, jaded, mm. but exactly. You are kind of gritting your teeth about it. He wants to right. talk about how badly his neck hurts or whatever. Right. You That's know? like a, the joke. Right. And you're like, this guy would have more of a sense of being an aggro badass. You need you need more edge to that character. Just a lot more You edge. can't make him inoffensive. Yeah. You can't. Uh, it's just out of touch. But everything in this movie is kind of inoffensive. But that's out of touch. Right. But, uh, you know, Spielberg, to his credit, and this is to his credit. Uh-huh. He's not on Twitter all day. Good for him. Hey, look, to his credit, makes him a better human being, <laughs> exactly. I'm sure. Wish he had voted March Madness, but other than that, maybe, maybe, maybe he started a dummy account just for March Madness voting and voted for Breast. <laughs> and then when Breast was out, he pitched a fit. Yeah, he went he full Gamergate. <laughs> that yeah. was it. That was the tipping point. Yeah, he initiated Gore Protocol. <laughs> exactly. Um. Yeah. No. I mean Spielberg. One assumes Steven Spielberg has played a video game in his life. He said he was one of the first people to own Pong. Yeah, but that's like because when he got up at South Pong by Southwest, he out. was like, hey, I'm a gamer. I owned Pong. I love the man, and I'm sure that that was an adorable grandpa moment from yeah. him. But like when Pong came out, like he had made Jaws. Like you know, yes. he was famous yes. and rich. Right. And he had the money because it costs like half a million dollars to buy a Pong cabinet. <laughs> yeah, to buy at that a point. fucking cabinet. It yeah. costs half a million dollars. How much do you think it costs? He had a Pong like, cabinet. Yeah, he had a Pong cabinet. And like Spielberg has many kids, mm -hmm. right? And he was the star of that weird movie-making video game in the 90s. Oh, right. And yeah. I'm sure he's produced other games. He has. There was a, a weird blocks game he produced. So, like, He I'm, started producing games in like the late 2000s, and none of them really connected. But like, God knows that Spielberg has very little grip on what you're talking about with the T.J. Miller character. He's also right? one of those guys who talks a lot about, like, I don't think video games are going to replace movies. A yeah, video game can't make you cry. Like, sure. he just kind of views video games. He's old. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to be mean about it. Like, it's fine that he thinks that. Because video games have made you cry, right? You cried The Last of Us. 100%. Yeah. The the first game that really got me, and of course, yeah, I mean, I'm not crying at Super Mario World, even though it's a masterpiece of art. I do think that game is, Super Mario 64, sometimes, I don't know if it made me cry, but it, it felt very melancholy to me. That Super game Mario felt 64 very is sad, very melancholy because very it's, lonely. it's about you walking into an empty castle. Right. And like that, there's something weird and haunting about the castle that there's no one there. Yes, that I always got depressed playing Super Mario 64 for that reason. Yeah, and the music and, was kind of sad, and you're just jumping into paintings, right? Whereas like I, Super Mario World, which is my favorite of the Mario games, uh, is not. It's a 16 bit game, but like it has like this sort of beginning semblance of atmosphere. Like there'll be levels you enter where there's like a little fish flopping around that doesn't hurt you, and when you're like, oh, that's like a little choice someone made, where it's like. Let's kind of set up what this level is going to be. You know what I mean? Like, it's beyond yes. just, like, obstacles. So he made it's a like, game. Oh, let's have a little, this like, is the thought. one I was thinking of. He made a game. He, Steven Spielberg presents. It's, it's literally called a Steven Spielberg game, Boom Blocks. And <laughs> Sounds it's great. Weird little blocky animals. It's like a puzzle game. I'm annoyed that I knew exactly how that was spelled without even thinking 100%. about it. 100%. Mark Mothersbaugh did the score, and it was... <laughs> It was for, sounds good. Yeah, it was for the Wii. Sure. And for the N-Gage. Yeah, well, the only, Nokia N only 2000s kids understand the N-Gage. And I think people said it was fun and it didn't sell well at all. Fair enough. Like, yeah. they were like, this game's really dorky. It's clearly, like, made by Grandpa. It is a really good game. And then they made a sequel uh, called Boom Blocks Bash Party. And I think that was the end of him doing video games well you know boombox wasn't gonna make anyone cry that's true yeah but uh i was also gonna say the first game i remember making me cry is wind waker i don't know if you played i've never played games. uh when you say goodbye to your grandma at the beginning of wind waker is deeply moving mm -hmm. far cry gets me every time <laughs> uh like going to Van jones uh, to the adventure continues uh i you know like i love ocarina but it's not really a you know, crier but wind sure. waker um so the third quest so the second the shining quest is kind of fun i like that h doesn't like horror movies the yeah, one like time that. someone isn't into pop culture. 
where they're like, you haven't seen The Shining? And she's like, no. Now we go scary. into the movie knowing that Lena Waithe is age because yeah. we're well-read men of, of the film blogs. Right. It does take a while to re- reveal that. It, it happens in the last 30 minutes or so. Sure. 40. Last act, yeah. Um, is in the last act the real world's a little more important? Like, yeah. Because Wade's aunt and uncle, who are sensitively portrayed, uh, get blown up. You killed my mom's sister. It's weird. <laughs> a weird line yeah uh yeah so but in the real you know in the last act they all meet in irl him right. and olivia cook and lena waith do you think even if you and don't Lutisha know Ray. that lena waith is in the movie and they're not hiding her from the marketing no she's, she's got the, a she's poster. poster she has her own character she's poster. on the cover of any fair exactly the the voice modulation is so weird that you have to know there's going to be some twist with yes that character, it's, it's, which is it, the, the character presents different. male right and then you find out it's actually a woman right right but H is still the best character. I agree. Almost by default, just because like oh, she's Halliday interesting is the best and character. funny. Well, yes, right. We are part, I, mean, I mean of the um, of the high five. No question. Uh, right, which is their the fun five. group. Well, okay. excuse me. Wait, you didn't think that was a cool name? Griffin. All right. More like low five I don't to get, me. I don't want to get fucking More like charged too up right slow now. five for me. But there's five of them. Yeah. Yeah. Ben and I just high five. Hey guys, did you know that Griffin is sick? I just threw my glasses on the table and I'm rubbing my temples. So the final, <laughs> the final um, quest is like playing an Atari game, and like only true eighties under kids kids understand that in adventure you win by. There's not an playing Atari the game and there are a thousand like, games, and they can't figure out how to beat any of them, and they keep so it's about the first them and you fall egg. through the ice, and that's to, again to Spielberg's credit, kind uh-huh. of, or the script's credit, or whoever. Like the that quest is literally like only true nerds will understand this, yes. right? But the movie kind of skirts around it by kind of not having the quest be that important. Well, because Sorrento other shit's going on. Sorrento is has trying to get there them in the real with world. Iraq, they yes. have some thing, some force field around it, right? It's so a no magic one, spell. No one can even get in. Yeah. So Parzival does his big like. This is our time yeah he broadcasts on all channels i mean this i agree with you because like this is where the spielberg movie should be like revving me up right like but this you is your fun last act and instead i'm like this guy i'm like thinking as he gives this big speech and i don't care about this guy i'm right. just sort of thinking like i hope the final battle's fun like yeah maybe it'll be cool you never get emotionally invested in this movie. iron giant right I, right and h has been building the iron giant the whole time and now she has it and he stomps around yeah, and people were like, I read some people, you know, people being like, "How dare they pervert this character?" Because like the Iron Giant doesn't want to be a weapon, and I'm like, "Have you played video games? That's all they fucking do is pervert yeah, characters." I mean, I think it's kind of funny in that way. Exactly, it's it's very apt, and also yes. let's not be precious about our pop culture, right? Like if you know, if we if we want to criticize right, Ready Player One, which is too precious about its pop culture. To their very faint credit, they don't very have faint. him go into gun mode. Yeah, no, it's not like he's he literally. Into it's a just that he's weapon, big Giant. and he's able to step over people and he, stomp he on. He things. shoots like a cannon at one point. That's about it. Yeah, yeah. And then like Dido's on the plane, and they're like, "Dido, what is it?" And his eyes are closed, and you're like, "Is he about to do something insane?" And then he just turns into Gundam. He just does the same thing everyone else is doing. He turns into a thing. The Chucky moment I kind of enjoyed. It's fucking Chucky. Yeah. I mean, Woo! I like I like Chucky. I He's love those, funny. I love that old. franchise, and it's funny Doll. to throw him out in that sort of setting because it. You know what the whole thing reminded yeah. me of, and there is literally a holy hand grenade. It yeah. reminded me of Worms. Yes, it feels you know like how Worms. Worms in like the later editions of Worms, they would be like, let's have more like weapons that are just references. It feels like Worms, and it's right. So it's That's just exactly like one guy is like, I'm going to use my Chucky now, right? But, but there's like the moment. Did you like Chucky? Yeah. Who was the guy that you? I leaned over and I said, "That's you." And you were laughing. I can't remember who was some 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 nerd. I don't remember. It was like one of the techs at the like uh, you know. There's the- a redheaded guy. You're probably being mean. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. Ben thought it was funny. Um. Meanwhile, Griffin's like sucking down tea. Yeah, I was sick. <laughs> I understand why you're holding this against me as if it was a choice. Wait, 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 because on, you on, get on. so mad about being sick. It's so wait, funny, Griffin. You're saying that you're sick. Okay. Guys, I didn't. I didn't realize this at all. Guys, I don't want to disrupt the flow of the podcast, but there's something else I've been keeping secret that I have to tell you guys. What's up? Logan is secretly a Western. What? Oh my god! Also, Deadpool knows that he's in a movie. No, stop. He does, and he knows that his FX show just got canceled. <sighs> oh, should we pitch the Deadpool thing? I think we should. Yeah, we're gonna take over the Deadpool cartoon. So here's the idea: <laughs> Deadpool 
<laughs> they were doing guys. Just FYI, movie. they were doing this for like twenty minutes last. The night. whole ride over to the theater, yeah, we yeah. were just doing Deadpool. Like they would not it. drop this bit, and I and then they were being mean to me because I had a bit about sexy texting that they didn't think guy? was funny. My bit, it was not I funny. Was and go fuck yourself. My bit is that I'm gonna get start a Twitter account called Not Deadpool, and I'm gonna get it verified. Because it's going to be like, yeah, you can verify that I'm not Deadpool, but the secret is that it is Deadpool. And the first tweet's going to be like, LOL, um, definitely not Deadpool. This is Twitter, though, right? This is right. a tweet. Right. Because the thing with Deadpool is you got to address the frame around the picture. Um, wait, what's this? What is he doing with that hammer? Oh, he's he's breaking the fourth wall. That's what he's doing. I think it's a good bit. Um. Deadpool knows, knows that he's in a movie. That he's in a <laughs> movie. I don't, check that check off. Check that off the list. <laughs> yeah, Deadpool's uh, going to have a movie that comes out in, I think, it's in it's in mid-May. Deadpool yeah, 2. Correct. That is certainly going to make more than this movie. Yeah. It's just crazy to think about that. Like, 10 years ago, no one would have said, like, well, I mean, Spielberg can have his fun, but like the real crown jewel of the summer is going to be Deadpool 2. And also, TJ Miller will be in both of those. <laughs> oh, God. And it'll be more awkward for this. No, for the dead. It's more awkward for Deadpool because he actually is. You see his face. They could have totally redubbed him in Ready Player One. They could have. That's true. With very little effort. That is true. And probably gotten a better performance. My only question is like what the contract shit but probably right because i assume he did a mocap performance right yeah yeah but yeah they could have easily redubbed him but what's i'll even say happen, like yeah what's gonna happen to the mucus guy though i think didn't they already oh did they fire him from i think Mucinex? manzukas is the mucus huh? i mean manzukas oh, okay. is great casting for That's, that i'm good with yeah, that. more That's like cool. jason man mucus hey man's mucus you know what i watched the other day that's okay what the house oh i've heard that it's okay it's much better than I thought it was going to be. You know my movie like that. What? I think Snatched is low-key good. I've never, I haven't seen that. I think Snatched is really dark and low-key good. Yeah, interesting. Also, okay. Christopher Maloney is the business in that movie. He's a good actor. He's got an incredible, like, three scenes. funny. Michael Shannon in the night before-esque sure, performance. Sure, sure. I mean, obviously, I'm referencing it because Manzuka's sort of, sort of the secret star of the house, but that's more just like a classic, like... He was meant to be the like Galifianakis. He's very funny. Right, right. But I honestly think Farrell and Polar are funny in it. Like, it's it's a 90-minute movie that feels 15 minutes too long. Yeah. But it's still pretty funny. Sure. Like, you know, and it's like a good movie about, like, just how broke the middle class is. Like, where, yeah. like, they all have nice houses and jobs and still they're like, why do I have no money? I, <laughs> why is sending my kid to college crippling? I like, like that it's, like, rooted in real shit like that. It's such a weird idea. Yeah, I guess. Where they're like, I guess let's have a casino. <laughs> like, I guess that, that's the whole movie. Okay. Uh, so the third act is they do the Atari thing. Right, they the got the battle. thing, they storm oh, yeah, the yeah. castle, and look, I just want to say one thing. Yeah, go ahead. We transfer make sharing big files easier than, I don't know, storming a castle to get the final key. No sign-ins. No avatars. No offer codes. No password to forget. No cost. You just upload the file, you send it, and you get back to making whatever it is you make, such as solid gold podcasts i thought we were going to do a bit where we went back and forth and i would list a real thing and you'd list a ready player one specific. i know but then i just sort of like got hooked by what we transfer actually does here's the thing we transfer is all about making the creative process easier for everyone everyone they built their site to be the simplest way to share big files around the world for free um you know i've i've used other file sharing things in the past and you gotta log in and you gotta like you know, attach an email account or something. Get out of here with all that stuff. There's you gotta no download sign an in. app. Nope. No offer codes. No password to forget. Just upload. Send. Get back to making what you make. So you like send, making that sweet love. Forty million people use it every month to send and receive files. They devote thirty percent of their thirty percent of their ad space to showcasing creative people from around the world. It's like people like, you know, musicians, photographers, or podcasters. Yeah. You know, so in that spirit, we're skipping the rest of the sixty second ad and getting right back into the podcast. Too sick, too phlegmy, no time for bits, Dr. Jones. WeTransfer.com. You make we transfer. There we go. So they break in. How how do they 
disarm the thing? What do they even do? Well, there's it's some like there's this, you know, sex and, and, and it's a funny video gamey thing. It's like IOI has bought like the best weapon, which is that shield. Oh, which kills everybody. Uh, oh, no, there's also that, right? The bomb. Right. The first is the magic force field that you can't put down. And then there's the bomb that kills everybody. Right. Uh, and it's like, right. Why would these things even exist? But video games always have some item where it's like it costs like a bajillion dollars. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, no one would ever play the game that much, right? Wrong. Um, Ben Ben made a face. These fat cats, these corporate fat cats, so they, they'll they, play it that they way. They take down the, you know, Artemis takes down the shield because she's on the inside. But Artemis has to sacrifice, like, she's the fucking sacrificial lamb. No, it's annoying. So that Wade can win. Who fucking gives a well, shit about Wade? Well, this is the whole Wade. thing. It's like all the battling happens, whatever, whatever. It looks fine. Spielberg's okay. But, like, that's the thing. At the end of it all, the big moment is um, Wade and Rylance in computer attic world. Right, because the big like, that's the that's the emotional crux of the finale. Everyone gets wiped out. Yes, but except for Wade, who has an extra life because the curator gave it to him. Yes. So he's back on the board. Sorrento thinks, "Well, I'm going to lose, but no one's going to win. So who cares?" Right, and then he's going to shoot them in the face. Yes. with a gun, IRL. Right, but that he doesn't do that because he's a total coward. And but, also, but you like, get into uh, fucking you know Rylance. I never made friends. You know. I don't know. It just. Feels- I think. I think the attic scene's kind of amazing. I think. I mean, it's I, uh, very well acted. It's I think well it's acted. very patly written. Yeah, it, it sort of. I think the, the whole thing the is yeah. so surfacey. He right. is so uninterested in grappling with anything going on in the fringes of this story, in the nooks and crannies, underneath the surface, and it's frustrating because it's like all there. Like you have a movie that is because of what the source material is an amazing vehicle to actually do a like this is the state of our world now movie right. and i don't think it has to be a self-hating movie i don't think it has to be starship troopers i think you can still have uplift at the end and let the hero win but i think you make a movie that just brings in some of the stuff and i think spielberg a doesn't care and b isn't keyed into it yeah and that's has, a bummer. He has this childhood self in yes. this scene. Right. Like you could kind of talk about how he's a lonely kid. He had a bad upbringing. There's right. like, so he's like, yeah, that's me. I play video games. Right, no, but I around. almost like how, like, I, I think I said this in my review, but there's like this weird idea where it's like, I think, I think, Spiel, I think Spielberg's a little keyed into where he's like, you gotta remember the people that make the things you love are weird shut-ins like yeah as i was like a spielberg was that kid and like there's this line he has that's so not profound that i think is from the book where he's like you know i like games but reality is the only place you can get a decent meal yeah. and it's like you hear what he just said and you're like well what that doesn't mean anything that's like bullshit yeah that's nonsense reality is the only thing that's real is the other thing that's well would that's even more spat that reminds me but i think spielberg's just saying that remember these guys are weirdos how do people poop and eat in this world it's a great question because he mentions like apart from bathroom breaks everyone spends all the time in the oasis and i was like where's the bathroom i don't think there's running water you could presumably, I mean, just shit in a bucket while you're in the Oasis and your shit goes in the real world. Does it look like you're shitting to people in the and Oasis? Like with your haptic suit, can you have like a haptic butt? Like, and you That's like. That's the thing. Like, early on in the movie, feel... he doesn't have the full suit. Know, he just yeah. has like the gloves right. and the thing. He gets Does it come wriggler. with like a digital catheter? <laughs> I don't know. Ben does it. These are questions I have. I don't, like watching this movie just felt for me like some ironic Twilight Zone twist ending of the movie I thought I wanted to see when I was 13. Yeah. You know? Wh- it's like, congratulations. Pop culture is everything you wanted when you were 13. Now have fun hating yourself. I want to play the box office game now. The prediction game. The burn it down, move to the Andes. But as part, no, you're not going to the Andes. I am. The show's canceled. I'm moving to the Andes. I, pe- pe- and delete all episodes. Guys, if you don't like that idea, please tweet at Griffin to not move to the Andes. No Andes? Should that be the hashtag? Yeah, sure. <laughs> no Andes. Guys, did you know that he's sick? Wait, please. Is I, Griffin, are you let's, not let's, feeling well? Let's keep this quiet, okay? I don't want this to blow up too big. <laughs> Here's my question, because yeah. and this is this is my transition to the box office prediction. Here's my question: What's the point anymore? What's your question, <laughs> Griffin? It's fun to make the show. Talk yeah, about this Ready movie Player threw One. me into some existential dread. Jesus. Um, 
This movie is doing better, way better at the box office than people anticipate. Yeah, it'll do well. No, no, but it was tracking at 35. It's opening to 52. Yeah. That's a major increase. Yeah. Do young people want to see this movie? I think. Like, are they actually into this? I, I, I don't know. Because this is a thing where, like, literally, not even uh, Warner Brothers estimates, but, like, all studio estimates yeah. were like, eh, it doesn't look like it's going to do that well. And now That's they're my surprised. Question. Is it front-loaded by 80s kids and 90s kids and whatever? Or, like, actual kids? Because I'll say, like, the beginning of this movie, when it's sort of just, like, jumping through the Oasis, I was like, this feels like the best uh, visualization of what VR could become. Right. And how it could be an exciting, all-encompassing medium. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, the way he cinematically shows VR. For sure. Feels like you see the allure of that kind of world. Yeah. And that's certainly a hook for kids, but it's also so bogged down and all this sort of self-referential stuff. I was on a, a comic book club, which is a very good podcast. Oh, okay. Uh, hosted by Peter Page, okay. uh, Alex Albin, and um, oh, I know Alex Justin Alex. Tyler. Sure. Uh, three gay, great guys who host a uh, weekly comic book uh, talk show. Okay. And they like to discuss the new comic books, the new things on the stands that week. Yeah. And like four of the comic books we were discussing that week were in some ways mashups of older things. Yeah. It's like the landscape now is like Gwenpool and like Gwenum, which is – Wait, if Gwen Stacy was Spider Gwen, right. but then also got attacked by a symbiote, then she'd be Gwenum. This, this is why I like stopped reading Marvel comics five years ago because I just like couldn't follow it anymore. Well, this is my yeah. point, and that's like there's a Thanos comic where it turns out that Ghost Rider is actually the Punisher, and it's like all of it is like Marvel's always been into the legacy of these characters, where they're mantles that can be picked up by different people, right? Yeah, there are different generations of these heroes. But now it's literally just become, what if it's this guy and this guy at the same time? Yeah. Right? What if you took half the iconography of this character and this character? Yeah. And I said to them, like, every time I hear about one of these things, people go, Spider-Gwen. And I go, fuck Spider-Gwen. I'm not going to read something called Spider-Gwen. That sounds dumb. Sure. And then people tell me it's actually really well written. Right. And then I because read there it. there are exciting new writers, and this right. is the thing. And I read the it, franchises. and I go, yeah. it's, it's really well written. But wouldn't I be more excited by this if it were totally its own thing? Yep. And isn't it kind of depressing that you're not offering new entry points for kids to form relationships with their own new characters? And there are exceptions. Like Ms. Marvel fucking rules. Right. There are things that are genuinely exciting and new. In but this so story. much of it. And Marvel NDC is a sort of mashup regurgitation thing. Yeah. And I just wonder if aside from – kids wanting to seem cool because they get the things that the gatekeepers have told them are important to get. And we certainly live in a culture where it's easier now to have a 101 basic knowledge of anything by spending 15 minutes on Wikipedia. Right. Do they care about any of the stuff that this movie is referencing? I don't know. I don't know. That's my question. I I was just surprised at the take at the 12 million Thursday. I mean, I'd love to see some sort of breakdown of the ages and I'd love to see the ages are up there. You can find them how it plays for the next couple weeks. Yeah. Because I could see this not multiplying well. I could see it doing fine. Well, it has very little competition next week. Yeah. Uh, so it'll probably do okay. Um, it, then Rampage. Right. It's going to be bigger. Yeah. So maybe that'll slow it down. Number one is going to be Ready Player One. Mm-hmm. It's tracking around 50, 52. Number two will be Pacific Rim. No, Acrimony, probably. The Tyler Perry movie. Oh, right. Uh, which is looking like it's going to open at like 2021. 20, yeah. Like he hasn't had one in a while. Taraji's. 20s. Good. It's going to like gross all of Proud Mary's gross in a weekend. Proud Mary is, we don't talk enough about what a fuck up that movie is. I know. Well, that's because no one bothered to see it. I saw it in theater. Someone yes. tweeted the gif of William Hurt and History of Violence saying, how do you fuck that up? It's a good point. But that's really what it is, where it's just like, that's that's an on-base single at least. And instead it's like, it's it's like they hit themselves in the face with the bat. Right. Anyway. The other ones, I feel like you're going to have Pacific Rim Uprising. You're going to have Black Panther. Maybe Black Panther jumps above it might. Pacific Rim it's this weekend. Pacific I think Rim Pacific Rim will days. drop harder. Yeah. And then I can only imagine that's a thing where it's like that might grow. That that movie is now like just such a phenomenon. Yeah. That, like, Isn't there another Faith one coming out this weekend, but it's not going to be as big? Another what? Faith, Faith movie. 
Oh, God's not three, dead three. Right. Uh, I, th- those don't do very well. Because we already have, well, the first one was big. Right, but, you know. Uh, but we are a Paul Apostle Dana Loesch Christ is in, is in the one. bottom of the tent. Jesus yeah, right. Christ. And everything. <laughs> Movies suck. I mean, God's, Fuck everything. God's Not Dead made 60 and God's Not Dead 2 made 20. Like, there's a steep fall off. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. 60, jeez. God's Not Dead. I know. I was in a movie theater and my friend said, is that a real movie? Pointed the God's Not Dead poster. Because it doesn't have a three in the title. It just has a subtitle. Uh huh. He says, is that a real movie? I said, no, is that a real movie? That's the third in a series of real movies. A Light in Darkness. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, John Corbett's still in them. Is Kevin Sorbo still in them? I think he died. Because he's the villain. He played the professor. Who's who, like, God is dead. Right. And like some brave soul is like, what if God isn't dead? And he's like, straight to jail. And he's yeah. put in jail or I something. I have cancer. I don't, I don't care anymore. Fuck the world. Yeah, right, right. Because right. certainly we should make movies where people have cancer or the evil. Villains. <laughs> what I hate are atheists. Um, so the universe is canceled. This is the last episode of anything ever. I'm sorry that Ready Player One was the one to do it. It broke to me. You. I'm also sick. I yeah, didn't want to see the sick, movie. Guys. Oh, you're sick? Yeah. Don't so, tell anybody. Uh, guys, Griffin was sick, but the thing is. We've recorded so many great episodes of Blank Check, so we can't cancel because there's so much great stuff coming in the yeah, future. Yeah, we're banked up through like August. Exactly. It's really exciting. Like, this is the second to last episode we're recording before I go film. That's right. We're going to do one more after this, uh, which is going to be a nice, happy uh, final recording. It's one of my... Because f- it's a movie we It's adore. a movie I've literally been begging like, to do an episode on since the beginning of the show one of the three movies that were like the first movies that were thrown out in like the brainstorming session of when like, we weren't even sure we if we were going to do exactly. miniseries when, when we thought just like, maybe, maybe we'll just do, do random one-offs. things yeah, yeah. It, it was one of the first things i ever pitched i remember that day i walked into the ucb offices yeah and you pitched me the Shyamalan idea that was an idea you had come up with independently yes yeah i was kind of the holiday of that situation right and then i Almost immediately countered with, we have to do the Wachowski second. Yeah. Because that was like, sort of, they were sort of my baby. Right. And you were like, only if we do Sensei. That's the only mistake we made. And then we thought we'd get canceled. <laughs> yes. Um, I guess we should mention at the end of the movie, Simon Pegg shows up and he's an old man now. And he's a, f- f- the friends you make along the way and what have you. <laughs> yeah. The end They're of the, the movie. high five. They take over. As and he goes, said. I close the Oasis on Tuesdays because real life, it's the only real thing. And someone Tuesdays once told me. Tuesdays. He makes out with his girlfriend with her disgusting birthmark. I do think that that was a little offensive that she's allowed happiness. Yeah, like, I considering that. that she's one of the marked ones. Yes, I mean we obviously just made a joke about making cancer patients villains, which yeah, is really people who have birthmarks. Abhorrent. They're they're the ones who should be rounded up. But that's not a joke. I mean they actually should. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, Olivia Cook is incredibly charming and very good in thoroughbreds. Yeah, she's. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. That was chilling. Well, I'm going to go celebrate Passover with my family. So am I. Ben, are you? Uh, no. You going to celebrate <laughs> Easter? Nope. You going to go home? Nope. Kids running around the studio. That's sweet. Yeah, that's Tiffany's daughter. She's really sweet. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, so I think we're wrapping up the episode. Yeah, we're but, we are. Yes. But, gentlemen. Yeah. This episode will be dropping Sunday. Okay. Fire. Uh huh. <gasps> and that will also be the last day of the bracket madness. Cause, bracket. Wow. Because wait, let me get the timing straight. It's like the thirty first, right? To t- to tonight will be the first of the final four. Tomorrow night's the second of the final four, and that will be the final. Yeah. When this drops. So maybe we should. Should we should we drop a prediction? How do you guys want to handle this? Yeah, oh, so it's the, April first, right? Uh, e- exactly. I, I think Nancy Myers wins. I think it looks like Fincher, Fincher is beating and Miller, Miller. Have been so very close. They were fifty fifty. Then Miller pulled ahead. Then I tweeted pro Miller, and then Fincher started gaining the lead. <laughs> right now, it's Fincher fifty three to Miller forty seven. So I'm going to predict. I think Fincher, that Fincher win. takes that. So and then I you think so you think that Myers is beating uh, Man? Yes. I guess I'll just predict that man will beat Myers. And then who do you think wins between man and Fincher? I think whoever comes out of man Myers wins personally. Interesting. My prediction is whoever survives that side is, is your winner. I think Fincher beats man. I think Myers beats Fincher. Interesting. I don't think so. Well, who knows? Just because that like, if I think the Fincher love has been kind of automatic 
And like the 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 ones that they've been the biggest passion for pretty much this whole time have been Myers and Mann. They've always struck me as the one that's the ones where people go wild for them. The only other one that people were going wild for was fucking Gore Verbinski. I know, but David Fincher's like pizza. Like everyone's just like, yeah, yeah. good movies. Interesting to talk about. It's very true. filmography. Real blank check guy. So I think <laughs> oh, like, accurate. <laughs> we don't see people who are passionately vouching yeah, yeah, for yeah, Fincher, yeah. although there are some of them. There's some. But more so most people just go like, yeah, Fincher. Right. And they just like vote and they move on. But he has never been up against someone, George Miller, I guess, being at the exception, because that was the one that was close. Yeah. Who like people were like, yes, Nancy Myers at all costs. And 70s like, alt, man. Who else did he go up against? Uh, Del Toro. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had people at their champions. I don't know. We're gonna. It's interesting. Find I mean, he was our out. first seed, and then the other three people who were still in the game were they're, between thirteenth and nineteenth seed. Yes, exactly. Like the second, third, and fourth seeds, none of them made it far. No. Um, it's interesting. It's uh, interesting. So that will be the person we cover once Griffin is done filming. Yes. But we have recorded. We're in the middle of the Brooks miniseries. We have two miniseries saved up after that. And then we have, uh, yes, two more miniseries that will go. And then we're going to do whoever wins the bracket. Yes. So that's the schedule. So there you go. I think it was successful. I think we'll do it again. March Madness? Yeah. 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 Also, like, I mean, there's been a lot of, like, uh, film, internet, entertainment, March Madness style brackets. And I like that ours has some stakes. It has their stakes. consequences. It's not it has, just like which is the best Pixar movie. It has seeding. It has seeding. Some of these fucking brackets. Yeah, have been going you around. can tell that they have not. And seeded. you know, people were saying to me when the bracket was posted, like, "Well, why is blah against blah? Like, why don't they have a shot?" And I'm like, "That's how seeding works. Yeah. Like, otherwise, it would be annoying. You would have like two big shots against each other first round." But also, look, we thought it was cruel to put Elaine May against Wes Anderson, and then she creamed him. Yeah, she did. Like, that's the fun of seeding. Is sometimes you're wrong, as we said. Like. First seed still in the game, two through twelve out of here. True. He's sick, guys. <coughs> All right, that that he put a little paprika on that one. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thank you to Lane Montgomery for our theme song, Joe Bond, Pat Rounds for our artwork, and Trigger for our social media. Thank you to WeTransferStamps.com, Blue Apron for sponsoring today's episode. I'm so sorry we didn't do any bits. I'm sure it probably crushed you. I'm sure all three companies have representatives listening who are so upset by the lack of I intrusions. Think we did good ad reads. Are you looking at me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're good. Thank Nothing you. matters anymore. Nothing matters anymore. Chaos reigns. Okay, well, it's actually just like a sort of three out of five. Okay. And as always, I'm going to go spit in the sink. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Is this wrong? I'm fine.